Un labdien! Labrīt! Labvakar! Esiet sveicināts! Jūs atrīkst no tā, kurā vietā šobrīd jūs atrodaties. Un, um, mēs sākam. Mēs runāsim par personas datiem, par nākotnes perspektīvām. Mums šajā sarunā būs iesaistīti speciālisti, kas atrodas reizēm dažādās frontas pusēs, bet pilnīgi noteikti ar ļoti, ļoti noderīgu pieredzi, ar ļoti, ļoti noderīgu speciālitāti vai titulu vai amatu. Jaunākās tendences mēs apskatīsimies, kādas ir personas datu apstrādes un aizsardzības jomā dažādās nozarēs. Mums būs um, katrā daļā, divas daļas būs, katrā daļā būs um, runātāji plus diskusija, kurā šajā runātāji vēlāk arī tad pirlīsies. Un um, pirmā daļa, pirmajā daļā mēs runāsim par žurnālisti, par vāda brīvību un datu aizsardzības robežām, kā tās mīdarbojas. Um, žurnālistiks mērķis demokrātiskā sabiedrībā ir dalīties ar informāciju un idejām sabiedriski nozīmīgiem jautājumiem, un jautājums, kas tad ir sabiedriski nozīmīgi jautājumi. Un tajā pašā laikā ir vienam ir tiesības gan uz vārda brīvību, bet arī tiesības privātās dzīves neaizskarīgi, kāds ir balans, kurā vietā novalkam strīpa. Tāda tā ir mūsu pirmā sarunas daļa, ar ko mēs arī sāksim. Otrajā daļā mēs runāsim par datu aizsardzību un mārketingu, kā tie varētu būt draugi, nevis ienaidnieki, jo šobrīd diezgan liela cīņa notiek par to, kur atkal novalkt robežu, kas tad ir vajadzīgs biznesam un kas ir izdevīgs patērētājiem. Mēs esam novērojuši, kā dažāda burbuļa veidošanās, kurā it kā tiek atlasīta svarīgā informācija, kas patērētājiem interesētu, veido burbuļus, polarizē sabiedrību, bet attiecīgo uz mārketingu, cik daudz biznesam vajadzētu zināt, lai patērētājs arī būtu ieguvējis. Lai nesanāk tā, ka beigās patērētājiem vispār nepaliek nekāds izvēles, jo to ir izdarījis biznesis. Mēs tu daļu sāksim, bet pirms tam gribētu iepazīnāt arī ar platformas darbību. Platforma ir tā, kurā jūs šobrīd redzat šo bildi. Es ceru, ka redzat. Ja pēkšņi redzat, ka es tikai māja rokām un skaņas nav, tur kreis jā, šajā sūrītī ir skaļurnīca, to var ieslēgt un izslēgt atrībā no tā, kā jūs to lietojat. Platformām var izvēlēties valodu. Ja jūs ar kursoru uziesiet uz tiešsaidas logu labajā apakšējā stūrī, ieraudzīsiet tādas austiņas, jā, audio austiņas, uz kurām notspiežot var izvēlēties valodu. Tur parādās latviešu vai angļu valodu, tātad varat klausīties šo gan tulkojumā no latviešu angļu, no angļu uz latviešu valodu. Vēl viens svarīgi lieta brīdī, kad jūs uzspiedīsiet uz tiešraidi, tā vai nu apstāsies vai turpināsies. Tā kā jums kaut kas ir ļoti aizkavējies, varat pārlādēt platformā tiešraidi un nospiest play. Vēl augšā virs tiešraidas loga ir dažādas izvēles. Alfa, beta, gamma, delta un omega tās ir dažādas zāles, kurās ir dažādas tēmas. Mēs atradamies gamma zālē, uz tās nospiežot atgriežaties šeit pie mums. Vēl ir iespēja padzīvi paspēlēties ar savu profilu. Tātad ielikt bildi, uzrakstīt, kas jūs interesē, jo kreisijā pusē, kur ir dažādi izvēli, tur ir stapiņš, tur atrodam arī programma, tur ir dalībnieki. Varbūt ir kāds interesants dalībnieks, ar kuru gribat sazināties vai izveidot kādu kontaktu, tad jūs ierakstāt savā profilā, kas jūs esat, kas jūs... In your profile you can indicate your contact information and which specific speaker you want to address. And maybe this way you can find some people who are interested in the same things. And also you can use the comment section available either below or on the right hand side of the screen. The uh, letter I uh, will open the survey screen and we could check whether the surveys are working. Here we have a very simple question in this survey where I hope nobody will reveal any very sensitive data. So the question is, what was your breakfast? Was it delicious and uh, adapted to this day? I, I couldn't, uh, didn't have time to eat breakfast. I didn't eat breakfast uh, because I'm waiting for lunch. So uh, either on the right hand side or below the screen, you can use the little I letter, the survey, window where you can answer this question about breakfast. It is important not only to pick the correct option, but also to submit it because only those who take part in the survey will see the results. So let's check whether this works. So on the right hand side or below, you have the comment section, you have a little eye in a circle, you can pick it, then you will have the survey about breakfast. So 6% of you uh, have not eaten breakfast yet. So 
we are just checking out uh, whether these surveys work with well, this little uh, informal survey just to see uh, whether we can express our opinions this way. So from all the people who have voted, we have the following results. People who ate breakfast, those are 72%. Those who didn't have the time, less. And, uh, and even less for those who are waiting for lunch. I understand that personal data protection is not a relevant topic when we're talking about breakfast, but here we just uh, want to make sure whether you hear me and whether, you're, uh, whether you can express your opinion this way. So maybe we can start because our speakers are ready online. So we will, we will talk about setting boundaries between freedom of expression and data protection in the field of journalistics. If we go back to the comments section from the survey, you can uh, write your questions there. If we have time for them, you, uh, they will be asked to the speakers. So refresh the page if something doesn't work. So how can we uh, limit the freedom of expression and where's the limit with data protection? Can we go without uh, data processing? And what is the role of state data inspectorate of Latvia in this area? So let us start. Uh, our first guest is the Ombudsman. He's been in this uh, office since the 3rd of March 2011, and he's taking care of uh, human rights in Latvia and the good governance principles. So Ombudsman Juris Janssons, please. I would like to congratulate you all on the national uh, holidays here in Latvia, and I would like to congratulate State Data Inspectorate on its anniversary. I thank you for the opportunity to express uh, my ideas, the ideas of my office, on the topic of privacy of, in theory and practice. For three years in the whole EU, we have the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, we are all informed about it. But here we need to put some specific focuses. We need to be stricter whether the public rights to data protection are being observed. Because people uh, consciously or unconsciously give their data away to uh, different kinds of institutions with discount cards and whatnot. So this topic is very broad. So in this way, privacy has somehow lost its meaning. It would lose its meaning if we do not take care of it. We need to talk about the legal regulation that is necessary to maintain control over personal data and their processing. But the GDPR cannot be used by politicians or other uh, well-known people to uh, just hide information that should be known by the public. The uh, Article 85 of the GDPR stresses this exact point that uh, people have the right for freedom of speech, but uh, in case of uh, journalistics, there can be derogations from this. Uh, regulation. It is very important to understand uh, how it is displayed in theory and in court rulings, for example, especially in the court context. In Latvia, data protection and freedom of speech is uh, reconciled by the GDPR and also the personal data processing law, especially Article 32 of this law, in which it is said that a person has the right to process data for journalistic purposes if this is done with the aim of publishing information for reasons of public interest. At the same time, the law stipulates that if the data is uh, processed for journalistic processes, purposes, then the GDPR does not apply. But be careful, it does not mean that we can use personal data as we wish. And uh, we need to think about the personal data processing law as well. Anyway, we have this conclusion that journalists 
have the right to publish information if it is in the public interest, but uh, they need to uh, they need to see that um, the privacy of people is not breached. So here it is a, a really complicated situation if we're talking about public officials or senior officials in the state. Anyway, public interest cannot be uh, the same time as just curiosity or sensationalism for commercial purposes. There have been some situations where this balance is not strictly observed. In a democratic society, the right for uh, data protection and freedom of speech are both important. And we need to analyze each separate case, the interests of opposing interests, to find this balance. We need to find the balance between both rights. We can also take a look at the case law and the criteria set by the European Court of Human Rights in the case of von Hanover against Germany and other cases. So let us discuss these criteria in brief. If we receive an application regarding a specific situation, we need to see the specific criteria set by the European Court of Human Rights. So we need to see the contribution of the report and the pictures to a debate of public interest. So the European Court of Human Rights says that public interest can be present in cases that is not strictly related to criminal cases or public officials committing some offenses. It can also apply to different kinds of events uh, in sports, for example, or regarding other famous people. The next criteria is the degree of notoriety of the person affected and the subject of the news report. So for people who are famous, their right to privacy are lower than, um, than just, let's say, ordinary people. And this is recognized also by the Constitutional Court of Latvia and the European Court of Human Rights. The third criterion is the prior conduct of the person concerned before the news report is published. So uh, whether the person wants to reveal specific information about themselves is important. The fact that the person has cooperated with the, the media beforehand is not sufficient to limit the uh, privacy uh, in, a, uh, in an excessive way. The next criterion is the way in which the information was obtained and its veracity, which is a very important principle and it is very important that we comply with it because journalists need to uh, work in good faith and compliance with uh, norms of ethics for journalists. They need to provide information that is truthful and that is not misleading or biased. The next criterion, the content, form and consequences of the publication. Here we need to understand whether the specific person has agreed to, for example, uh, taking and publishing of this picture that was published later. So facts cannot, can be checked, but uh, opinions are subjective. They are the subjective views of a specific person. The last criterion is the gravity of the penalty imposed on the journalists or publishers. Here it is important to determine whether the media has had access or restricted access to publishing a specific news report and what has been the gravity of a penalty if a penalty has been applied to the journalist. So this was my short overview. Thank you for your attention, and I hope that we will have very fruitful discussions. Thank you, Mr. Janssons. One of the questions, and the first question that comes to mind, taking into account your position, you need to represent both sides in, in searching this balance, right? So what is more difficult to defend the freedom of speech or uh, 
privacy and rights to privacy. I think the most complicated aspect is to find this, these middle grounds where the balance is. Similarly to other topics that are, uh, that are related to the COVID pandemic, we are basically uh, located between two worlds, between two opposing sides. But we need to make sure that the rule of law is uh, applied and there is this balance between rights, there is this equilibrium. That will be my answer to this question. We are in favor of freedom of speech, but we also need to defend privacy, which is also a principle set in the Constitution. This was Ombudsman Joris Janssons. Thank you. Thank you. We will continue to look for this balance and principles uh, for setting boundaries between freedom of expression and data protection for reconciling personal data protection and journalistic rights. So the next one, uh, next speaker is Justice of the Constitutional Court, Artur Skuc, who is also professor, associate professor at the University of Latvia. He has worked extensively with international human rights uh, questions, case of the European Court of Human Rights, and um, he's also the author of many articles. So he has had in-depth knowledge, he has in-depth knowledge about this topic. So he will tell us how to find this balance. Please, Mr. Kuch. Good morning uh, or hello wherever you are today listening to me. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the State Data Inspectorate for inviting me uh, to give a presentation in this very topical matter and also congratulate the Inspectorate on its centenary this year. My colleague, uh, Mr. Janssons, uh, also touched upon several issues, um, but in my presentation, uh, I would like to uh, focus on the general principles and then perhaps uh, go uh, into the specifics regarding the rule of court and uh, the approach to access of court materials for journalists. Starting um, on the uh, uh, topicality of this uh, of this uh, issue in this digital age uh, of course uh, fight for data protection is very very difficult and um, the gdpr is one of the last uh, stands uh, in this regard that is trying to protect and also highlight the importance of personal data uh, if we look at the USA, for example, data protection uh, is um, in a worse state than it is in the EU. Of course, we can uh, pose a legal question on uh, what is the importance of data protection for our society and um, uh, whether the new generation that is used to sharing on portals uh, their information, whether they understand that data protection is an important value and uh, how do we see this ourselves individually. Uh, on the today's topic in particular on journalists, my colleague Mr. Jansons already touched on several principles on uh, creating the balance between the freedom of speech and data protection of journalists and um, I have uh, indicated these two uh, basic rights here in my presentation but uh, of course uh, we need the freedom of journalistic expression also freedom of speech of press and also the freedom of speech. So we need all of these basic rights. Uh, I would say that there is no discrepancy between all of these. Uh, on journalism in particular, one of the issues that is being highlighted in court rulings and uh, case law a lot of the time is uh, how we understand the term journalist today, whether it is the classic traditional concept of a journalist uh, who works for a specific type of media and has registered at uh, the Association of Journalists, uh, or do we consider journalism according to its function, which is a broader term. 
uh, because anyone can, in a sense, become a journalist and, and perform the journalistic functions. Um, people actually, uh, uh, a lot of the time, express uh, or publish important information in public. Um, they observe the ethical code of practice of journalists, and they can, in fact, be called journalists. And this was established by the European Court in the Boivitz case against Latvia, where um, a person recorded uh, his interrogation at the police department and that was later published on YouTube and uh, in fact this case presented the question whether this this person was uh, performing his journalistic uh, function and this was uh, assessed by the court but uh, in this specific case this is under the national jurisdiction uh, the GDPR has not to define the journalist in its most narrowest sense. If we look at the case practice in Latvia, we see that this uh, exclusion is applied to processing of data for journalistic purposes. Uh, so this is in a broader sense, it does not apply only to journalists per se. In Latvia, uh, we sort of differentiate and say that if a person is not a journalist, but he has a journalistic intent, uh, the person needs to justify the basis of why the uh, information is requested and how it will be processed. From the regulation, uh, there is not such a distinction, but in practice, we see that there is a lot of nuance. Uh, in uh, section 375 of the criminal law that uh, stipulates the right of persons to get acquainted with case materials. This only applies to journalists under the press law. Uh, this uh, is not uh, publicly accessible information, so we still kind of see this differentiation uh, depending on how we look at this issue. Uh, also, the, Mr. Jantons, the Ombudsman, clearly uh, stated that we see in case practice the problem that uh, information is of limited access. It does not mean that this information cannot be received. It is important to note that requests of information are based on legitimate interests. In this case, for journalists in particular, or other people for that matter, uh, they must state uh, why they need this information and what is their intent and purpose uh, for the scope of information they are requesting. Uh, then uh, the heads of uh, institutions uh, need this uh, justification to ex to evaluate uh, whether uh, this uh, request for information is proportionate and whether this topic is of public interest um, and really important for the whole of our society, not just for this particular person. And then um, uh, we ex we evaluate whether this uh, request is justified. Uh, regarding court rulings, in general, they are. Uh, this is information of public access for journalists and for the general population. It is accessible uh, unless uh, these are closed court hearings. Otherwise, this information is of public access. Uh, of course, uh, personal data is redacted. Regarding case materials, the general principle is that uh, this is um, restricted access information. Here again, I would like to highlight that there is 
uh, limited access information, but it does not mean that this information cannot be provided. It simply means that when journalists ask for this information, they need uh, substantial justification for why they need this information and how they plan to use it thereon after. We must ensure that there is a link between the justification and providing this information, and so we evaluate that based on this justification. I will now provide a few examples from our case law um, in the uh, Constitutional Court. Uh, in the case on the solidarity tax, uh, the court was asked to reveal the names of legal entities and registration numbers that have turned to the constitutional court. And uh, this was done for the purpose to evaluate uh, whether the tax is in line with our constitution. In this case, uh, information was requested and the journalist indicated that uh, the aim is to promote the rule of law and principles of good governance in Latvia, but uh, the Constitutional Court denied the request to get acquainted with case materials because they were of uh, limited access. And the aim or justification for its use was to general and non-specific. In this case, I want to ask what are the interests that need to be balanced in this particular case. Um, and I'll go back in my presentation. Uh, data was requested on legal persons that have turned to the court, but the Constitutional Court said that uh, this uh, request would make it possible to identify the legal entities on whom the solidarity, solidarity tax was applied. So it would give some indication of their remuneration. Uh, this, uh, these, uh, this uh, is under the GDPR. Also, the companies have indicated uh, that this information is a commercial secret. Um, the amount of remuneration paid out by each entity is, in fact, a commercial secret or trade secret. And in this case, it we have needed to balance these two interests and, as I said, uh, the Constitutional Court uh, indicated that, and its decision consisted of a single sentence, uh, the aim was to uh, general and non-specific to be able to balance between these two interests. The second example I would like to share uh, regards um, a situation where uh, where lawyers and, and students of law sometimes do not understand what we are talking about. There's a problem of communication, I would say. And this is a specific case where journalists ask to provide information on a claimant, the name and surname of a claimant. The case concerned a prior a person that had served a prior penalty and therefore he uh, he could not become a part of a, a state-owned enterprise um, and uh, the journalists as I mentioned um, asked for the name and surname of this person the constitutional court rejected this proposal Uh, it said that uh, this is uh, information of limited access until a final decision has been made regarding this case in the court. Uh, this is a usual practice at the court um, when first the information of, is of uh, limited access. 
And here there was an issue of communication where the journalist uh, thought that uh, this will become public access information. So there should be no justification for um, being provided this information, but uh, the court still has to balance uh, this journalistic interest and private data protection. Um, so here, again, the main thing is that there was no justification by the journalists because journalists believe that this is public access information. Then, uh, the last example I'd like to give today um, where a journalist asked uh, to be provided information on business trips of the uh, uh, justices of the Constitutional Court, and this information was provided by the court. Uh, also, administrative courts probably have more cases that concern data protection, but uh, we had in our administrative court a case regarding the concert hall of measure parks and its uh, estimates. Uh, information was requested uh, by a journalist um, uh, on this estimate. Uh, however, Riga City Council rejected this request, uh, stating that it is a trade secret. However, court later granted uh, this uh, request uh, since uh, it was uh, uh, submitted by a journalist and also taking into account that uh, this money that was uh, was to, to be used to construct this concert hall would be taxpayers money and uh, also these uh, amounts of money are frequently inflated when it comes to construction and so this was uh, information of public interest uh, regarding courts in particular uh, there's a differentiation between case materials and case rulings, which are of, of uh, public access. Uh, when ruling on uh, access of information, uh, it is a set principle, but uh, the details are nuanced. Uh, it depends on whether these are journalistic interests or interests or public interests, and um, in that case, in both cases, we actually need a more detailed explanation. Thank you very much. I have a question. Usually people uh, have a very simplistic view on data protection. When people are receiving taxpayers' money, it should mean that citizens should have all the information on what they are paying for, but when it comes to private companies or or private entities that are not public officials or politicians are people of public interest whatsoever, then uh, this is their private business. So when, where is the limit between public information and private life? I think this answer will depend on different societies. Uh, Currently, there is uh, public access related to remuneration of uh, public officials, but uh, there is none on private entities. Uh, of course, uh, this principle is interpreted by various uh, institutions. Uh, some indicate this in detail and some more generally. But uh, it is important to answer whether we need to know the specific uh, wages of, of specific people or do we need to see the general level of pay that uh, public officials of various levels are receiving. So these are still uh, open-ended questions, but uh, when it comes to private entities, there is no such uh, request. Uh, so you're saying that this will depend on national courts, national legislation, and also who is requesting this information. Well, yes, when it comes to public interests, of course, we are mainly discussing taxpayers' money, so it's important. Thank you very much, Mr. Kuch, for your presentation. Now we will invite uh, 
a person that is continuously fighting for this balance. We will invite Mr. Andres Vasks, a journalist working for the investigative journalism program Neka Personig. He has been involved uh, in these issues and uh, examine in detail all these laws and regulations and it will be very important to hear his opinion and where he himself draws the line. Mr. Vosk, the floor is yours. Hello. Uh, good morning. Thank you for this invitation. I congratulate everyone with the national holidays approaching and I will probably uh, start with the important things. To understand where is this border between the aspects discussed, we need to understand what's a journalist, what's the media. And I would like to um, make a distinction between uh, social media creators and uh, journalists. So these are separate stories, separate categories. So bloggers and influencers are not the same as journalists because there might be a different term applied uh, to them like social publicists or another kind of definition which might be specified in the GDPR because professional journalists should not be compared to people who just um, occasionally write about some topical issues in their private web page or on their private blog. So what is a journalist in my opinion? It is a person who has studied the profession of journalism, the profession of journalist, um, and uh, like me, uh, uh, I have not had a formal education in this field, but I have studied it. Uh, and uh, journalists are usually members of journalist associations and they normally receive remuneration for their work. So this describes a professional, uh, a specialist in any field. If you want to be considered a professional, you need to receive remuneration for your work. So the difference between social media users, uh, journalist articles are prepared uh, by the request of editors and uh, journalists and editors take responsibility for the articles published, which is an important aspect. So journalists do not work on their own benefit, they work for the benefit of the public. Personally, I do not care that much about uh, the, uh, the uh, operations, the breaches of uh, Riga traffic company uh, and uh, whether, uh, whether they were taking the public money. But as a journalist, I investigated this issue and um, well, that was my job. So I uh, had uh, I had the means, I had the uh, duty to address this issue so that um, the public, each individual, does not have to address each employee of the Riga Public Transport Company or so that they don't have to address the government to know what kind of money was spent where and uh, for how long. So why is it important to be informed for every member of the public? And this also applies to the essence of the work of journalists because this allows us to make information-based decisions and this allows us to communicate with other people based on actual knowledge and facts. We can engage in meaningful conversations about topical issues, we can learn from others' mistakes. So there can be very many examples why people need actual and truthful information. And this is not just only information about laws and regulations, but also, well, maybe what uh, celebrities do in their private life or uh, what public officials do. So all of this information is uh, somehow important to different parts of the public. The special role of journalists and editors is to pick the information that would be important and relevant to the public. So, if a journalist feels that it is necessary to obtain specific uh, personal data, then there, there must be a justification for it. So, this is uh, a reasonable 
um, reasonable application. So in laws, we also have the duties and rights of journalists that confirm this. And here I would like to stress the um, difference between application to receive personal data and publication of personal data. So in my job, I need to get um, personal uh, information about officials like uh, their place of residence uh, and uh, their ID number so that we can see whether they are not living above their means or whether they are not um, part of, they do not take part in some uh, illegal companies or businesses. So the, uh, um, the name itself might not reveal whether this is the exact person that appears on the Panama Papers. But the fact that journalists obtain personal data does not mean that all this information will be published because uh, readers are not interested uh, in the ID of a specific official. From my experience, uh, I can give you an example of, uh, of a story that ha did not have uh, a happy ending, but still. So I had a correspondence about uh, uh, with the state revenue service and uh, about their officials and their remuneration. So first I asked for the data of different levels of managers, uh, motivating it that I need to see whether the fines and penalties are commensurate and whether they're applied similarly in similar cases. They are proportionate and uh, people just do not receive lighter sentences because they work in the management. We had a specific breach in the customs office where very many employees were uh, fined. And here I wanted to see whether managers received the same fine, the same penalty. Uh, on the website of the State Revenue Service, we have information about uh, those who have debts for tax, but uh, no such information about the management level. But uh, about the officials, the State Revenue Service said that they would uh, not reveal this information because these officials would suffer more than the other employees if the, these data were revealed. So regarding these proportionate um, uh, proportionate punishments. This is not under the competency of journalists as stipulated in the laws and regulation because the institution itself will be the one assessing what kind of punishment is to be applied to the specific employees, but this can be, uh, this can be discussed at a specific uh, courts if, uh, if the journalist is interested in it. So the State Revenue Service sees that the punishments given to uh, officials, um, journalists should not be uh, informed about them. I complained about it to the Ministry of Finance and they said that the State Revenue Service should provide this information, but uh, they didn't like my argumentation uh, either, even though I think that the arguments I gave were, were justified as I do not have specific data on specific officials, I do not know their names, their specific positions, I do not have this information. So how could I make my arguments more specific if I do not have this information? And, and I also cannot write in my justification that uh, someone is just helping uh, those who are breaching laws, in this case, the workers, the employees of customs office. Currently, I have not uh, applied uh, to court regarding this issue. Uh, I have not appealed their refusal. Uh, I might, um, uh, might go once again to the Ministry of Finance so that they influence the state, state revenue service, but they have some kind of mutual relations there, I believe. So maybe I won't do that either. As Mr. Kuch previously indicated, that um, the courts sometimes do not reveal information because when we request uh, information as journalists, then we receive information that has been made anonymous, which does not help us in our work. And the, the final decisions should be made public, but it 
it looks like there are less risks involved if the information is made anonymous, so that's what they do. Basically, journalists are not interested in some petty crimes and uh, the names of the convicts, well, maybe in some very specific cases, but basically we uh, we uh, just look for information on people taking bribes because um, before we have uh, this final ruling there's the innocent presumption of innocence regarding public officials but after the hearing uh, and the ruling has been given it's already a fact so we need to know about it basically we learn some facts at some point of investigation, but we do not have full access to information. And then some journalists may publish information, which is not like final information, and then we just need to trust the investigative institutions. But journalists need to have access to information and facts. So the final, um, final conclusion Mm, is that the um, basic principles are in favor of journalists, but the actual practice and specific cases show that it's not always the case. Thank you. This was Andres Vasks. One quick question. In practice, in the actual life, journalists need to take into account two aspects that people basically only read the titles and not the details and titles only contain a part of information not all of it and the second aspect is cancel culture because um, maybe one time a person has had this uh, misstep they have fallen from grace and then for their whole life they have this burden and they, uh, they are basically cancelled. They have no more chances in professional life or private life either. And maybe this also applies to officials. Do you think there's uh, something we can do in this aspect? And why I'm asking this? Because then people might be more willing to share data about specific people. This is a complicated question because everyone can uh, provide comments everyone can do as they wish and thousands of people can come to their own conclusions and publish them online if uh, uh, someone who is in the public eye says something that might be controversial and then as you say this person might get cancelled and i do not see a solution a ready-made solution for this yet Thank you, and we will see you in the following discussion, because after all the presentations, we will have a common discussion where we will see all the questions discussed and see different positions of the speakers. Thank you. The next speaker will talk in English, and if you need interpreting into Latvian, then you can press the headphones icon on your screen where you can choose the language that is spoken. Well, either the original source language, in this case English, or and then interpreting into Latvian. So our next presenter, our next speaker, is the board member of the Human Rights Monitoring Institute from Lithuania. She has studied the GDPR very extensively and uh, specifically the journalistic exemption in EU countries. And here we will be able to compare the EU practice and Latvian practice. Uh, Natalia Bichikova. Now, I don't know if you've listened uh, to previously said by journalist Andres Vasks, uh, what is the situation in Latvia? And that would be very interesting to, to see uh, where we are on the same uh, playing ground with Europe and what are the differences. So I believe that is what you are stepping in with. Welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you Hap, for having me today um, and thank you for the uh, Latvian Data Protection Inspectorate and my very warm congratulations uh, with the anniversary to Latvia from Lithuania. And indeed, um, as said, I am going to uh, briefly talk about the tensions between freedom of expression and data protection um, that we are observing right now in Europe 
Um, I will discuss how GDPR attempts, um, successfully or not, uh, we can discuss that later to balance those competing rights. Uh, what are the national approaches to implementing um, GDPR test? And I will summarize the outstanding challenges at the very end of the presentation. Um, let's kick off with um, some tensions. Um, already in 2018, um, when GDPR uh, just came into effect, Paul Chadwick, um, and one of the Guardian editors, uh, as well as the lawyer uh, by trade, uh, has raised an um, issue uh, with, um, in his opinion, data protection undermining journalism. Specifically, he said that um, the data protection principles make sense, and I quote, until you try to apply such scheme to journalism. The revised law, and by that he meant uh, the UK data protection law implementing GDPR at that time, pits media and data controllers directly against individuals and data subjects with enforceable rights. Some of them will be lawyered up, powerful individuals properly subject to journalistic scrutiny. Um, we've seen some tensions materializing already in 2018, later in 2019, um, in an infamous case uh, related to the um, Rice Project, whereby one of the um, journal investigative uh, journalistic communities was asked to reveal journalistic sources by the Romanian Data Protection Authority, uh, and that has been escalated to the European Data Protection Board later on. Um, the Hungarian organization, Hungarian Civil Liberties Union, uh, defending journalistic freedom and freedom of expression in Europe has also observed that the number of strategic lawsuits, so-called slap cases, based on GDPR against journalists is on the rise. Um, and specifically, some of the individuals are also seeking not just challenge the publication, but also they're seeking prior injunction for the publication not to be released, something that is considered to be an, a, a severe a freedom of expression violation. Um, that has prompted, all these developments have prompted, at that time, President-elect Vera Jourova um, of the European Commission to um, sort of request uh, opinion by the European Data Protection Board, whether such uh, interferences are justified, as well as to ensure uh, that this has been looked at uh, when GDPR effectiveness has been assessed in 2020. Um, and indeed, uh, that question was uh, one of the questions raised during the um, GDPR assessment. Um, and in 2020, um, I believe that was uh, around, yes, June, the Commission has published a report. Among many other things, uh, they also looked how the journalistic freedom being balanced uh, with the freedom, uh, with the data protection. And essentially, um, the conclusion that they have reached perhaps is not particularly surprising. They made a broad reference in the report to the fact that data protection rules should not affect their exercise of freedom of expression uh, by creating chilling effect and that these two rights should be balanced. Again, um, this position is very far from you, in my opinion. And it essentially echoes the rich jurisprudence in this area by the European uh, Court of Human Rights that uh, Professor Kutch has already covered, and also perhaps less rich, but nevertheless very important jurisprudence of the Court of Justice of the European Union. Now, the question that uh, perhaps um, I have, and it would be useful to ask ourselves, is given the number of these notable cases, um, exemplifying the tensions between journalism and data protection. And in general, uh, this pushback, um, if I may call it like that, by the media community towards GDPR, maybe GDPR has uh, established a different balancing act between these fundamental rights than has been developed by the European courts uh, within the last 50 years. So in order to answer that question, firstly, let's uh, take a step back and take a quick look at the predecessor of the GDPR Data Protection Directive of 1995. And um, the directive was uh, the key piece of legislation at that time, harmonizing the approach to data privacy across the EU member states. Um, essentially, it had this very brief article um, 
mandating member states to provide exemptions or derogations from the data protection rules um, for uh, when uh, freedom of expression is exercised for journalistic purposes, if such, if such exemptions are necessary. This is more or less the source that has been used to build what we know the journalistic exemption under the GDPR today. Um, but legal text aside, uh, what is interesting is that in 1997, the predecessor of the European Data Protection Board, Working Party 29, has released an opinion uh, looking at the recommendation, looking at data protection law and media, and what they have done they have actually compared um, the member states and how they implemented the specific Article 9. What they have noticed is um, that data protection led, that essentially there were three groups of member states. In one group, uh, media was completely exempted uh, from the general data protection uh, legislation, and it was regulated by some separate laws. In other member states, media was exempted from some of the provision, and in the third a group of member states, uh, data protection legislation applied to the media in full. So there were clear inconsistencies um, across the member states when it came to the implementation of the directive. Um, and that uh, has been perhaps particularly well documented in the survey conducted among the data protection authorities in 2013, where um, authorities have been asked whether a person who has been subjected, who was a subject of a journalistic investigation by the media entity, had the right to access of data held by him by that media organization. So that was more or less about the right to access in the context of journalism. And the answers that the authorities have provided are summarized on this slide. Uh, but just to voice over, 11 of the data survey data protection regulators said that the journalist, uh, that the person shouldn't be able to access the information, um, sorry, that the person would should have a right to access the information, except for the one related to journalistic sources. Some have said that they sort of have this theoretical right, but it might be that journalism should trump the rights in this case. Five authorities said that the person shouldn't have any right uh, to access this information. One DP had a completely opposite view and said that actually the person should have access to information in full. And two regulators said that some modified procedures should apply. Um, and when the researchers in this case try to understand what is the reason for such a divergences, it seems that it, the reason is not even in the national law because the interpretation uh, offered by the data protection authorities was, some, was sometimes less strict than the permissions under the national law, and in other cases, more strict. It seems to be better explained by the how strong self-regulation in the specific, journalistic self-regulation in the specific country is, and also perhaps can be attributed to some of the cultural norms in the country. Now, let's take a quick look at how GDPR transpo, uh, follow, whether GDPR has followed the suit of the Data Protection Directive. If we unpack GDPR quickly, we, should, we will see that it not, doesn't permit member states to reconcile freedom of expression and data protection, but it imposes an obligation on them. And such obligation applies to processing carried for journalistic purposes. And journalism, according to GDPR, should be interpreted very broadly. Um, there is no definition as such, but um, as Buivit's oh, case has already been covered, it seems that it should encompass not only professional media, but also see citizen media as well, as long as the whole purpose of processing is disclosure of information to public. The possibility to exempt uh, from the GDPR application is very broad, so essentially member states, if they wish, can exempt journalism from all data protection obligations, um, but only when it's sort of necessary to do. And this necessity, this is a reference to the, to the well-documented um, European Court of Human Rights necessity and balancing test. So as such, GDPR is not introducing particularly new approach to balancing, but rather reiterating the one from the 1995 and even the one going further back, uh, if we consider the um, European Court of Human Rights approach. Now, um, how the member states have um, implemented this. 
Well, in order to understand the differences across the um, uh, member states' implementation, we need to look at three criteria. First, national laws differ on the point of who can rely on the journalistic exemption. And in some cases, um, the laws limit this rate only to the media organizations. So contrary to what GDPR requires, they interpret journalistic exemptions narrowly, and they allow only media to rely on that, whether other laws are much more permissive. Uh, the second criteria or point of difference is material scope. So what are the circumstances uh, needed for the exemptions to apply? And I will analyze that um, in a minute. And the last is the nature of derogations. So which rules of GDPR can be disapplied and to what extent? And um, if we take um, the best overview, I think uh, to date has been provided by Professor Erdos, who has analyzed um, all the um, laws um, of the EU member states. And imagine if we kind of take all the laws and divide them um, and try to categorize them uh, by starting from the laws that allow to exempt journalism from any data protection requirements, those we, uh, those would be awarded uh, a rating zero, and um, those uh, laws that require journalism to live up to all data protection obligations, that would be no derogation laws, and they would be awarded uh, a rating one. So if we compare all of them, we will see that um, there are a couple of outliers um, around the, within the EU member states that require application of all the data protection laws to journalism within, without any exemptions. And there are a couple of outliers that do not apply data protection laws to journalism at all. In reality, majority of the countries are in the middle. However, all of them are taking very, very different views from very strict exemptions to very broad and permissive exemptions. What we also see is that if we compare this to the results of the uh, assessment of the data protection directive implementation, there hasn't been any considerable change. There were divergences in the past and divergences have remained. Um, more careful balancing, introduction of the more careful balancing act uh, can be, however, observed. And more member states right now recognize the need to qualify application of transparency rules. So informing people about how their data is processed and application of sensitive data rules. And uh, what we also see is that more member states want to limit uh, the rights of the data protection authorities in um, supervising journalists um, for when they process personal data. However, less member states want to exempt them in full. So to limit, but not completely restrict this right. Um, and I here will provide just a couple of examples to show how different the tests are. So if you look at the example from Romania, you will see that in Romanian case, there are only three circumstances where journalistic exemption can be triggered, um, and they are rather narrow. So although they may apply well to some of the investigative journalism cases, they will be less likely to apply to kind of more marginal uh, journalistic pieces, perhaps not so much, and um, related to investigative journalism. If, however, you compare the test um, from the of the Romanian data protection law to the one that is codified in the UK data protection law, you see that the UK data protection law allows much more case by case assessment um, in order to decide whether public interest in the specific case should trump a data protection regulation in favor of freedom of expression. So these are very, very different um, approaches. And perhaps the most detailed um, attempt um, to establish this material scope has been put in place in Bulgaria. And uh, in Bulgarian law, the legislator tried to specify 10 criteria which should be taken into account in order to determine if journalism should be exempted from the data protection rules. And these are criteria here on the slide. However, what happened is that the Bulgarian Constitutional Court uh, at some point rejected this clause and essentially found such a detailed balancing unconstitutional, as they said, the legislator is, attempted, is attempting to sort of limit a judicial freedom to decide on case-by-case -case basis how freedom of expression and journalistic 
uh, and data processing should interact. So currently in Bulgaria, the list, such a long list doesn't exist and um, the constitutional court expects um, the application of the rules to be balanced on case by case basis. And lastly, what I wanted to point out is even if the um, journalistic processing falls within the personal scope of the law, as well as the material scope of the law, whatever the criteria locally are, as I mentioned, different GDPR rules may be disapplied as per country. So here I compared four jurisdictions against some of the basic uh, GDPR requirements. So as you see, for example, let's look at the Article 12. So this is a transparency requirement, whether journalists should inform data subjects or individuals about how their data is processed, whether they should respond to the individual request of access or erasure or rectification or whatnot. So in Sweden, um, this rule wouldn't apply to journalists, so they wouldn't have to live up to this requirement. Same in Lithuania, same in Romania, whereas in the UK, it would partially apply. Uh, on the other hand, um, the first one is related to um, this article 5.1, and this is about security of processing. So whether media organizations or whoever processes data for journalistic purposes should secure it to protect confidentiality of data. In Lithuania and UK, yes. In Romania, they don't have such an obligation, and in Sweden, they have very limited obligation to that extent. So as you can see, uh, the divergences are really uh, quite uh, wide. And just to summarize the challenges um, that we are seeing across the EU member states is, first of all, to answer the question if the GDPR has somehow fundamentally shaken the balancing exercise between freedom of expression and data protection in the context of journalism, the answer is no. It essentially follows the suit of the jurisprudence of the European courts. Um, as well as the Data Protection Directive. It indeed seeks to find such a balance, but it, it sort of puts the obligation of such balancing on the member states. So how effective the balancing approach is mostly depends on a couple of criteria, how, the, how specific the national law is, um, and the second one is how the implementation of the national law or interpretation of the national law by the judicial authorities as well as the data protection authorities, if they have the right to interpret this in that specific jurisdiction is performed. Um, so that was uh, my presentation today, and um, I'm happy to take questions as well as them to engage in the further conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Natalia. And uh, please stay because you are also taking part in the discussion and where we will ask all the speakers come in and uh, join. And uh, they will be joined also by one more participant. Uh, Those who followed the presentation or have questions to ask, this is the moment to provide your comments on the platform. Cindy asks, uh, whether a recording will be available to view later, and others agree because these presentations are very quick. But the good news is that you will have a month to uh, look at these presentations once again and jot down all the data that you need. Now I would like to invite all of the previous speakers. Uh, Ms. Bityukova, Mr. Kuch, Mr. Janssons and Mr. Vasks, also Ms. Evie Kreishmane. And uh, we will uh, continue with the discussion on the balance and the boundaries. Also, what do people expect and what can they expect from the State Data Inspectorate? What are its tasks? and limitations, and what is the State Data Inspectorate expecting from all of these invested parties? What can be asked of them and what should not? Let's try to understand this situation. Also, there's a question on um, the aspect of data protection from the point of view of privacy. What can we expect of one another? 
and how to understand these issues better. I want to remind you, for those listening to us in Latvian, the discussion will follow in English. This is an international discussion, so please look into your window and uh, move your cursor on the headphones icon where interpretation is available in English and in Latvian. If you understand English but do not speak English, uh, you can ask your questions in Latvian and then they will be interpreted into English for our participants. That's why I was asking uh, those who need translation, go to the translation um, button uh, next to the window of our transmission. We will talk about jurisdiction of the Data Protection Authority and the court with regard to journalistic needs. We're still on journalism. And we will be defining the proportionality criterion, what is proportionate and what is not. So where's the balance? So this will be our um, main topic. And if there are any questions uh, for the listener or from the listeners, uh, please join in in the comments and ask those list, uh, questions there. So first question to all of you, and you just can raise your hand because I, I can see you, and uh, I will ask to uh, speak a particular uh, speakers then. And the first question is, so what is the interaction between the right to protection of personal data and the right to privacy? Um, more specifically, how can these rights be distinguished? Is it possible that in circumstances where the processing of personal data for, journalist, for journalistic purposes has been found to be compliant with the data regulation, but a breach of privacy could still be identified? So, right to protection of personal data and the right to privacy. Oh, so, who's ready to make that edge? Anybody? Please raise your hand if you could answer that one. Uh, maybe we could start. Maybe we could start with uh, somebody who hasn't been yet speaking, uh, Evi Kreishman. <laughs> so maybe you can help us out uh, to make that very important split. Thank you and uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I will. I will try to start, and I will. I hope that you will join me afterwards. And uh, one thing uh, I, I would like to say is that uh, Data State Inspectorate Authority is uh, limited to the scope of the GDPR, of course. And uh, besides uh, the tension of data protection, uh, privacy and freedom of expression, also there are may be cases when those uh, data are being processed in, uh, for example, a newspaper, who, and this newspaper is not digitalized and uh, there is no search functions, and then uh, it is uh, not the, in the power of um, uh, data state inspectorate to assess uh, this uh, data processing in the terms of the GDPR, this is one thing. And still, uh, there may be some uh, breach or limitation of the rights to privacy, of course. And uh, also, I, uh, I would like to say that, uh, of course, when uh, data proce processing is taking place, it, uh, I think it will always involve in some aspects uh, rights uh, to privacy because uh, as we know right to privacy stem from the right uh, to be left alone and when someone is processing your data of course you are not uh, being left alone but you are brought to in some way you are brought to spotlight but still there may be cases when uh, you, uh, the data processing is uh, is done in accordance with GDPR, but there remain some um, privacy issues because the data state inspectorate is not looking at the context you are processing the data. And uh, in uh, some ways, uh, um, your owner may be 
limited, or, or you may feel that your reputation is uh, not rightfully presented in this um, publication. And this is a context uh, in which a data state inspectorate can, cannot uh, uh, take any steps. So, yes, it's not an easy task to separate those bo uh, both rights, but uh, we must understand that uh, uh, data state inspectorates' uh, powers are limited and limited by the GDPR. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, we uh, now know the position or actually the, the rule for Data Protection Authority. What about the court? So, Professor, uh, your turn. You were also reacting on uh, whatever you were saying, and I have to warn you, I can see your reactions, and I will ask you about those. Uh, so, what about the courts? Where is that distinction there? Uh, I don't think I can tell about all courts, so if you ask me, but, 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 <laughs> but uh, broadly looking, starting from Constitution, since I'm coming, representing Constitutional Court, uh, Latvian Constitution Article 96 basically provides a right to privacy, a broad right, which includes also data protection. And this has been traditional approach, I would say, more broadly, if you look classically at, also at the European Convention of Human Rights, then also the court includes data protection within the Article 8, which is the right to privacy. Of course, if we look at the EU, legislation and EU Charter of Fundamental Rights, we have two separate rights. And uh, when you asking when you need to distinguish, I mean, for constitutional court, as regards the basis, we don't need to distinguish because right, data protection in most cases would be covered by right to privacy in Article 96. However, I understand what Evie also said for as regards their competence, uh, and their their tasks, they 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 it, this distinction might be important. For them. This is this is like so. And Evie already mentioned some 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 cases where, for example, privacy might be breached, but data protection is is not breached. But you may may also see examples. I would say where privacy is not breached. But data protection might be breached. For example, I remember I just to example when before COVID it used to be a time I also traveled. And uh, I had one academic project in, in Italy where I had to go once a year to meet colleagues. And I remember when I went to the hotel and uh, I showed them my my passport to register, they said we don't need because we have everything for uh, from last year. All your data is still stored. And I would say it's a classical example where I think data protection would be violated because they stored the information more than it is necessary. But I don't think I can claim, for first glance, I don't think I can claim that my privacy would be violated because they store it only in their system. I'm not so sure if I could claim privacy in, in a, like a classical sense. So there might be also, though well, there might be situations when I indeed, but if I can say, like, give a general definition how we can really make a distinction, I don't think so. I think that you should really look at the case and and then, and, and it, in most cases, the rule, I think, will be overlap between the, between the two, between the privacy and data protection. So, but it would be also interesting how, how to see how, for example, in Lucienne or Natalia, but we looked in a broader context, how whether this distinction is, is really, for example, in the system, whether there is a clear distinction between the two. Okay, um, before we move on to European uh, scene, I have to ask Andres, because he is representing the journalists, we are talking here this uh, for so, what is your take on this uh, distinction? Uh, is that that the problem at all? So, is this a problem when we talk about um, the right to protection of personal data and right to privacy? Please turn on your microphone. I do think it is an issue. I have a case in mind. We were talking about the media when uh, a a 
famous person uh, had a baby and they were uh, coming out of the um, of the hospital and a journalist took a picture of this uh, new family and the journalist got in trouble because the uh, the lady who had just become mom was a lawyer and uh, there was this uh, this was, this situation was taken to court. I truly do not understand why the journalist acted this way because I think this is a, a border that should not be crossed. Um, publishing a picture without um, the specific person's consent. In our work, um, in investigative journalism, we have uh, different kind of issues. When talking about privacy, if we are talking about officials, how how much they are protected, what is the limit uh, of their protection, because sometimes we need access uh, to very sensitive data about their place of residence, about their family members, but there we have justification for it, there is a specific goal, why this is needed and why this is necessary for the public. But there is this limit, so it should be reviewed from case to case, to see where the limit is. If we're talking in general without a specific situation in mind, then it is very difficult to draw this line. That would be my response. Uh, cases were... Um, okay, I just I have to ask, uh, Natalia, have you had translation for this or... Yes? Yes, yes I have. Good, so I won't do it. Thank you very much, thank you. <laughs> Good, so we are all uh, covered now. Uh, next question, Nakamai Siautam said, opinion speakers on social networks. We've touched already this one, and uh, what is the distinction between the journalism and uh, uh, bloggers and vloggers and um, people on social media who sometimes, or very often, uh, they feel uh, that they would be also the representatives of the general public, they are uh, working in their interests, but as Andre said that as a journalist, there is a quite um, uh, distinctive difference. As he says, uh, you should be educated as a journalist, you should be supervised, you should be in, uh, in some association of professional association which uh, shows that you are the journalist. You should have a editor who is double checking on the facts and who is uh, somehow deciding also what do you do and you should really re represent public interests and uh, not only uh, the cu uh, curiosity of the public but the interests. So that's a distinction. But still, how does the need to balance the individual's right to data protection with the right to freedom of expression apply to opinion speakers and social networks? Uh, because unlike uh, traditional media, those people on social networks, uh, they have neither the knowledge nor the skills needed to carry out a balancing test. So who could start with this? So what is the difference? Should there be a difference? Because uh, also, uh, Professor uh, already Professor Kuch uh, mentioned that there are cases where uh, bloggers and vloggers and social uh, celebrities are considering themselves journalists. So anybody on this, and maybe Natalie, uh, you could uh, start with that. Of course, I'm uh, happy to pick up. Um, if we look at them, how the courts interpret this and what GDPR says about who the journalist is. And I have to make a disclaimer here. We are only talking about the context of data protection, right? In other contexts, whether it's context of ethics or maybe some professional requirements, it might have a self-standing definition of what journalism is and these two don't necessarily cross. But under GDPR, it, it never kind of uses even the word journalist. It talks about journalistic purposes. And by journalistic purposes, um, it means sort of any sort of, um, it's not really about who, but it's about for what reason and how. And the reason is the provision of information to the public, the genuine provision of the information to the public. And perhaps the best case um, to, to exemplify that actually comes from Latvia, the one that Professor Kuch has covered is the famous Buivitz case that is quoted and cited in all the panels uh, whenever we talk about journalism data protection, simply because there is nothing more out there uh, decided by the Court of Justice of the EU, for instance, on this topic. 
However, the purpose itself, it should be fair. And as I mentioned, the disclosure of the information and comments to public. Even more, we have to remember that the rare cases, such as Sata Media case, where it has been also said that such disclosure can be made for for-profit purposes. So it's not just uh, non-profit uh, disclosures, but also for-profit purposes. In my opinion, though, if the purpose is different, if the purpose is commercial, for instance, and of course, a lot of influencers and bloggers actually do have commercial purposes, not just informational ones, then uh, data protection, the journalistic exemption should not be triggered and completely different set of rules, be it marketing or whatnot, consumer laws should apply. The possible solution that I can also see some of the countries applying here is to link the exercise, the, um, the possibility to rely on the journalistic exemption to compliance with the self-regulatory measures. So, for example, let's take France, where um, in the French law says that journalistic derogation can only apply, meaning the journalists can be uh, freed from certain GDPR provisions or obligations in the data protection law only if they comply with professional ethics rules. And the same is for Belgium. Journalist is um, only if the person complies with the professional ethics rules, can they rely on the journalistic exemption. Now that makes sense, of course, but on the other hand, if challenged, um, if for instance, a person exercising not being a professional journalist, but being a civic journalist, would want to rely on the journalistic exemption, such a law might be found to be too narrow. Um, from the perspective of the GDPR that defines journalism very, very broadly. So there is a possibility look legally to establish a presumption towards journalism, but there might be some marginal cases that also need to be accommodated, such as the one in Boivit's case. All right. Uh, so maybe uh, I could ask Yuris to step in. And um, so we've been uh, talking about the balance between uh, journalists and data protection and personal lives. So what about the balance between uh, journalism and social media? Do you have any cases and where are you standing in your um, work? Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you for the, the question. Uh, actually, it is uh, uh, quite complicated, uh, clearly uh, answer uh, so broadly because we actually um, need analyzing uh, some uh, uh, some cases. But uh, regarding uh, the regulation, uh, states that the term uh, uh, journalism should be interpreted broadly. This is also uh, confirmed by the case uh, law of the Court of Justice of European Union for uh, in, in, in case uh, Buiri case, if, if, if you if you remember, and uh, there is uh, some very very uh, important uh, aspect where an individual uh, who is not a journalist by profession uh, proceeds video recordings uh, which uh, he publish on a website, these footage may fall uh, with the concept of journalist purposes. If it is established that the uh, activities are carried out uh, solely for the uh, society and such purposes. And uh, according to the Court of Justice of the European Union also states that the fundamental right to privacy with regard to the processing of uh, personal data on the data subjects and the fundamental rights of freedom of expression of the data um, controller must be harmonized. In carrying out this balancing or, 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 or account uh, shall be taken off Firstly, whether the disclosure uh, contributes to the debate in the public interest. Uh, secondly, public recognition of the affected person, affected persons. Uh, thirdly, the subject uh, matter of the report and the prior uh, action of the person uh, concerned and uh, the content for and effects of the publication under consideration and the circumstances in which the information was obtained. Actually, this is the main principle that we uh, uh, should take into, into account. 
so anyway, at the end, it will all end up in the court, where local courts will have to decide uh, uh, what happens in this case. But I would like to ask still, uh, Evia, is there any principles uh, which um, those people on social networks could use and say, you know what, this I can do and this I can't. So is there, I don't know, top three rules? <laughs> it's an interesting question, um, uh, but uh, I would pr uh, propose uh, one uh, one rule. It's common sense, and uh, on the bright side, I think that uh, everyone who follows this common sense and intuition uh, can can understand uh, where his or her interest stands and where the nose of the other person starts. Uh, I think it's not uh, that hard. And uh, one more thing is that um, no one is uh, obliged to rely on exemptions. And uh, if someone do, then of course uh, obligations comes as a bonus. And uh, if you want exemptions, you have obligations and responsibility with them too. Mm -hmm. It's uh, yes, but uh, no, no written uh, necessity assessment is uh, required. So I think it's it's generally yes, it's common sense. All right, uh, Professor, is there anything you would like to add on this, or because I've heard you already were speaking on that? But but yes, anything. Just, just very shortly, yes, I mean, what, what, with whatever you finished, I think if you claim a journalistic exemption or for journalistic purposes, to be clear, as Natalia said, I think it should come also with the obligations. It shouldn't be only rights, then, but there are some obligations which you have. And honestly, myself, I was a bit surprised with the Buivitz. I would say it's a very broad uh, formulation, but that's what is currently standing, and I agree with Natalie, that's currently the test. But it's a questionable whether in the future, if Court of Justice will have more cases, it will have a possibility to clarify. And I think what, what the examples you mentioned about France and Belgium to link between the functions and the need to observe journalistic ethics, this is also the path followed, for example, by Council of Europe recommendation on new media. And I think that's quite logical. If you want to use the same exemptions as journalists, you should also follow the journalistic ethics. But it's an open question for the Court of Justice if it, I agree with, whether it will satisfy Buivit's test or not. Thank okay, uh, let's move on. On censorship. And this is the question. Um, so does the national legislator by obliging the supervisory authority to carry out the balancing test between the various fundamental rights of a person, risk that the supervisory authority becomes the censor of the content of publications. Like we've heard, Andres was telling that yes, by law, he has a right to uh, get some certain information from the organizations, uh, but the um, um, the, uh, those responsible at those organizations are really trying to somehow secure the data of their employees and, uh, and saying that, you know what, yes, I know, but in this case, that's the very special situation. So let's talk about the um, a supervisory authority. And that probably goes straight to Evie. How do you know that at one case you're not the censor of the content of publication and you really stand for the uh, personal data security? Yes, thank you for the question. And uh, this is a question we are asking ourselves, ourselves every time we are dealing with this question. And sometimes I think we feel like we're standing on the edges knife, trying not to fall on one side or another. Uh, it is not easy, but uh, one thing uh, I mentioned already in the first question, I think, is that we are uh, dealing only with uh, balancing uh, of the rights to free speech, uh, to the rights of data protection, uh, nothing more, no privacy, uh, mm, no rights to any other rights. 
Uh, and uh, I think uh, the first question we should ask ourselves is uh, that of uh, if this free speech or data processing, if, it, if this data processing really takes um, place in the context of free speech, because uh, not all speech is protected by constitution. And uh, only then when we have established that really this is free speech, we can go further. And uh, this balancing test, uh, we find that it's closely related to the purpose limitation principle and data minimization principle stipulated in the GDPR, Article 5. And uh, generally, we are asking if those data is really needed for the purpose stated. And uh, is this really the least intrusive way to achieve this purpose? And if we are satisfied that yes, we are not going any, uh, any further, um, because of course, generally we think uh, that uh, this balancing has to be done by courts. And, but it's a really tough question and we are um, struggling with that. Because, and trying to, to because find Andres balance. was mentioning cases where the intention is is very crucial to understand why people are doing something, and that's why they they journalists need data on certain person and their situation in in the company or in, in the organization, and that's why that uh, um, information is needed. But they are turned down, saying that it's too much to to be asked. Uh, Natalie, anything to comment on that, please. Um, perhaps I would just, maybe we'll approach from a bit of a different perspective, looking at the institutional angle of that. And it's interesting that this discussion is, is emerging again, whether or not supervisory authorities should at all, from the normative perspective, have powers over, over journalists in the context of data protection law, because that was one of the two kind of big questions debated even before data protection directive has been adopted, where we had just a couple of laws on privacy here and there. And one question was before uh, the adoption of the directive, should we at all subject journalism to anything under the data protection law? And the second question, if we do so, should we or not limit by law the powers of the supervisory authorities uh, in this area? And the consensus has emerged uh, that uh, we don't want to, like on the European level, there is no common answer. So this is why kind of this was framed as the responsibility of the member states, right? And from the member states perspective, what we know right now is 12 member states apply the full regulatory model to journalism. So in 12 member states, data protection authorities have full rights. Um, of oversight over the um, journalistic expression when it comes to personal data processing. But uh, in other cases, there are certain limitations and some are broader and some are more narrow. So just to give you an example in Lithuania, um, if the processing of personal data takes place for journalistic uh, purposes, artistic or um, academic uh, expression, the supervision is entrusted not with the general data protection authority, but with the so-called inspector of journalist ethics. That in general, it's a the institution has been established quite some time ago, and it has to do. It's not a self-regulatory; it's still a public authority. It had to do with um, disputes are related to defamation and ethical matters. But when the national law implementing GDPR has been adopted back in 2018, that specific element has been sort of entrusted with that authority. Um, and it's a similar, the only country that follows a similar model is Denmark. So imagine if we have a case where a data subject is challenging how his data has been processed in the say digital publication, but then that dispute will go to the um, inspector of journalist ethics in Lithuania and some sort of the equivalent authority in Denmark. Well, is this good or is this not? Um, it's difficult to say perhaps, but we are seeing some tensions in Lithuania in terms of sometimes divergent interpretation of certain norms uh, by the, say, the general data protection authority versus the inspector of journalist ethics. 
Uh, so it's questionable um, how, how good this model is, but perhaps we just need more practice and more analysis to understand it. There could be other models in countries where there is still one authority. Um, it would be, say, general data protection authority. We would have general powers over supervision, how journalists process personal data, except for certain elements would be excluded. So, uh, for example, in Sweden, the exclusion is framed very broadly. It says the DPA has rights of supervision as long as those rights don't conflict with the Swedish Freedom of Speech Act. So it's sort of balancing exercise before balancing exercise. Even before kind of engaging in the supervision, you have to understand how two laws interact. Whereas in Bulgaria, again, DPA has powers um, as long as they, but they cannot challenge processing related to confidentiality or journalistic sources. So if something is around that, then the powers of the Bulgarian DPA are limited in that area. So this is just to give you um, some, some, some broad strokes uh, from the uh, different European approaches. Mm -hmm. Uh, Andres, um, you are representing journalists here, and that's why I would like, if, and the idea was, we are now trying to find how we can work together on this. So, I would like to ask you, Andres, uh, what is the model of cooperation and what is the most successful, maybe, cases where you've been working um, with uh, Juris Janssons, uh, with uh, Datuvalst Inspektion, uh, Evius organization, and uh, maybe even uh, cases with the courts, where you can say, you know, what uh, that's how we do this that's how that works and uh, and you can help maybe out other journalists to find out what is the best way to work with personal data and still get your job done <laughs> so yes it is quite difficult to mention specific cases when cooperating with specific uh, organizations it is normally successful, but if we need a, a court ruling that is not edited, not made anonymous, then if we ask for permission non-officially, just if we want to get this ruling and read it and get to know it unofficially, then maybe uh, some, uh, some um, judges will permit this. But you probably are interested in the larger scope. Yes, uh, taking into account we are five people here and you can uh, talk to one another, you can you represent different fields. So as a journalist in this conversation about um, successful discussions, what you could suggest to others maybe. So what could we suggest so that uh, we do not turn to censorship? So that was the question about um, when uh, taking care about uh, protection of personal data, maybe the um, supervisory authorities start censoring data. Yes, when the state data inspectorate uh, decides whether to um, provide access to information, they say that it's upon the court, but this is not a good idea because when not providing information, uh, state officials are not punished. They can just say that uh, the GDPR does not allow us to provide this information and for providing such answer they are not punished, they do not have any consequences. And uh, what is more, uh, lawyers have a different sense of time, three years till uh, the final ruling is okay for them, but for us we need uh, to publish information in a week in a month because uh, later on it is no longer topical, it is no longer relevant. And then the uh, authority in question does not provide information when asked. Uh, they will provide it when it is stipulated by law, which can take a year or two years. It no longer is relevant, so I need to uh, stick by my principles. I need to get into arguments with them and get into discussions because I need to prove my point because information uh, relevance is very important to journalists and uh, when uh, when we get it according to the law in one or two years it is no longer uh, relevant and necessary to us so it is too late 
But this is not a matter that should be discussed with the Ombudsman, but maybe with the legislature. So maybe there should be some kind of consequences for not providing information. Or maybe in a criminal cases, there should be just a, a straightforward answer of yes or no provided straight away. Yes, um, basically, uh, I would like to agree, but at the same time stress that there are three significant principles that stem, that can be applied to any kind of situation arising in life. So the rule of law, fairness and transparency. If we follow these principles, then theoretically we should not have any issues, neither one were uh, accessing information or publishing it. This is a very general approach, but but this is also said, or at least included, in Article 5 of the GDPR. These are general principles that can be applied not only to uh, data processing, but in general as well. And officials use this, as said by Andres, they kind of uh, do not have any consequences uh, when not giving information, uh, so they stick by the law. Well, this is a very general view, but uh, we should not obstruct access to information. The fact that something is not stipulated in the law, it does not mean that uh, chaos should ensue. So we can interpret it, we can also uh, refer to good governance principles, which is also set out in the constitution of our country. But good governance is not uh, actually carried out in the most successful way, and m maybe according to, con to the constitution. English. Piedod, <laughs> um, Jautājums. Uh, question. Ja žurnālistam kāds no lietas dalībniekiem nodod pilnu... So, um, can... Uh, Mm, can uh, people protect uh, uh, their uh, rights if journalists publish uh, information online? So let's get this straight. Uh, does this happen at all uh, or, or is this not relevant? In my uh, work it has not happened, but if it does happen, but it is quite difficult to protect the data. We just need to hope that the people publishing the data has had sufficient motivation to do so. Um, is there a time limit for the right to, uh, to freedom of expression? For example, if any journalistic activity has been recognized by the supervisory authority as complying with the data regulation, can the data subject lodge the same complaint on the same subject? like after 10 years, hoping a different outcome. Yeah, now you've said, no, it's, everything is fine, then 10 years passed, and the same complaint comes in, and uh, it, it comes out already in different way. And I guess this is a very uh, certain case. If we have like 10 years, the same complaint, who can comment on that, please? So, is, will, that, will that stand in 10 years, saying that yes, it was about freedom of expression, and then the data subject comes back in 10 years and says, you know what, I don't agree. Evie. Uh, thank you, but I think Arthur was uh, raising his hand. Maybe I can okay. give the okay. floor to Good. him first, and then right. I will. Good. Professor? So, I think the question is a bit abstract, so we have to know the real situation, but in principle, if I understood the, the, it correctly, I would say the situation might change after 10 years. And for example, I am now a judge of the Constitutional Court, and society might have more interest in my, also, partly also my private life, probably to some degree, because of my position. But after 10 years, when uh, I'm not anymore a judge of constitutional court because we have a time limit for judges in constitutional court, uh, the situation might change. And uh, 
it might be quite a different context and uh, it might be still a question whether the public interest is as strong after my position has changed and I don't have any important public position. So in that sense, I would say uh, 10 years may, may it, you have, it might be totally new situation where you have to balance the two, two rights, uh, right to freedom of expression and right to data protection. So after 10 years. And also, for example, if you look at the uh, judgments of the European Court of Human Rights, and in general, for example, it's also always a question how long you can keep on and say that person has been convicted for that and that uh, purpose. Okay, it might be of public interest, but you always have to judge it, whether if it has done it 10 years before, if it's still actual and relevant in the media to, it might be situation when it's relevant, but it might be situations when it's not anymore so important, I would say. So that would be my short comment. Okay, anybody else? Yes, now I can <laughs> add something, yes. I completely agree that after 10 years, it's a different case. Uh, but what I would like to add that, um, of course, uh, public interest uh, may fade with time, but a different interest may kick in, which is uh, as, as important as other. And it's, uh, for example, um, historical research purpose or archiving purpose and um, it's uh, it's uh, in the interest of the public to remember the history and uh, historical research uh, cannot be done objectively if uh, something is deleted after time just because uh, data subject doesn't want it to appear uh, on the internet anymore. So uh, after 10 years, we may have to balance uh, not only free speech with uh, data protection rights, but also with the archiving interest, which is part of free speech as well, uh, and, and uh, different rights. Mm. Yeah, Natalie. Just to reflect slightly on this conversation, it, it, it has been quite a big topic when the digital archives have emerged. Um, and the discussion has started back then, again, around the time of the Data Protection Directive's adoption, perhaps a bit earlier. The challenge that has been grappled with is, it's of course, a very, very similar things to what Evia has just uh, raised regarding the historical research and how that can be impeded and in general freedom of expression. But one sort of competing line of thought was, it's one thing when we have a researcher having a purpose and going to the archive and performing a set of actions in order to obtain information. And it's a bit of a different situation where information is available for everyone for a limited period of time, just with a click of a button, which could from the kind of individual and humanistic perspective undermine sometimes the person's, not like a legal right, but a moral right to almost reinvent themselves. Uh, but of course, it's very difficult to put a timestamp on that and say 10 years is good enough or 20 years is bad enough. And I think that has to be balanced uh, extremely carefully. Just to give you an example from, uh, from Belgium, there was a case decided, uh, I believe, back in 2016 by the Belgian uh, Supreme Court. And that had to do with the, um, um, with the article that was published, I believe, 20 or more years ago about the doctor, a private person, um, who has been in committed, uh, who has been convicted for drunk driving. That has happened 20 years ago and the article has been published 20 years ago. Um, and at that point it was either digitized or put sort of in the digital archive and it emerged, re-emerged again in the public domain. So uh, that doctor has uh, approached the newspaper requesting to not to delete it completely, but to anonymize, essentially arguing that even though that information has been relevant 20 years ago, uh, today, republishing that article not only harms his reputation, but sort of in general undermines his, and this is perhaps this fundamental right to privacy. Um, and in that case, the court found for the plaintiff, it found for the doctor, and it tried to specify the criteria based on which uh, such decisions should be made. And what the court found that in that specific case, there was no specific reason to publish the article again. 
It's not that the doctor has engaged in the drunk driving once again or for the third time. Nothing has triggered that publication, simply the, uh, the technical setup. The content of the art article as such didn't have any historic value. And that might speak to the decision of whether or not, for the purpose of research, say 50 years from now, whether that would be relevant or not. Um, the, um, a certain amount has, of time has paused between first and second publication. So again, there was no new context added. And 20 years from now, that wasn't so relevant anymore. And the person involved hasn't been a public figure. So that element that the person hasn't been publicly known, again, one of those criteria found time at a time by the European Court of Human Rights has been factored in here. And also the fact that the person has been rehabilitated to the extent that the kind of the statute of limitations has expired on the offense that he has committed uh, many years ago. So due to the uh, combination of this criteria, it was found that um, it was no longer justified in the interest of freedom of expression to republish this article or to keep it in the digital archive, non-anonymized. So just to answer the, the first question that has been raised here, in my opinion, yes, this is a possible scenario where at one point of time, it is relevant to make a publication and it wouldn't be a violation of data protection law. And many years from now, that could be considered as a less proportionate infringement of the right to privacy, um, to give a very simplistic answer. But of course, case by case analysis will be needed. So th does it mean that person can use the right to erasure uh, thing in this case or uh, something else? Um, that will depend on the national law, because as I mentioned, uh, in some countries, um, the, um, the legislator has exempted media from the right to erasure. So, for instance, in Lithuania, um, journalists or whoever exercises um, freedom of expression for journalistic purposes and process data to that end, uh, they do not have to comply with the right to erasure or any individual rights requests. So, yes, in principle, if the law allows, that could trigger the right to erasure, but not in every country. It depends very much on the implementation. Mm -hmm. um, anybody can con comment on, on this particular uh, one thing, the right to, uh, to erasure, um, in the light of our question from other speakers? All right, then uh, let's go for social media. Uh, we've seen that very freely, sometimes in the press, uh, printed press or uh, any portals, you can find information which was taken directly from a person's uh, social network profile. Um, even sometimes, if that um, news or that picture, for example, of video is restricted for a very uh, small amount of people or followers. So what is the situation on this? Can journalists reuse personal entries on social networks, publishing personal data and how far they can go there uh, without acquiring consent or, or informing the author about the processing of his or her personal data and how far we consider that information a personal data? Um, first, let's start with Andres. What is the, your, I would say, inside rules, or uh, what is what is the way you do it, using the information from social networks? No, Sometimes we do use this data gathered from social networks. Again, perhaps we uh, exception applies to us because we do investigative journalism and our our clients or data subjects are usually public uh, officials or public persons. Uh, social media uh, does have a problem because we cannot take images from Facebook as Facebook, as I understand, has claimed that it is their property. So we cannot uh, freely uh, gain images from Facebook because we do fear that somebody could come with a, a claim against us. But uh, images that are of limited access to friends and followers are frequently used. Uh, but uh, in general, we cannot define how close is the relationship between the followers. Uh, actually, sometimes 
Yes, uh, we do use these images at times to to describe the person, uh, the, the target of our investigative piece. Uh, when uh, a person pretends to be um, someone else, but we see on his personal profile that he's completely different in his real life. So again, this falls under the question of intent. Are both sides can go protecting their data. Labi, jautāsim tad došanu Jūrim. Jūri, vai ir gadījies? So, a question to Mr. Jansons. Have you ever dealt with such claims and protests? Yes, over the years uh, there have been specific cases, but again, of course, we must take into account the fact that there are the principles, and if we observe them, if we follow them, there should be no specific issue or, or difficult situations, but people are different, of course. We see that, uh, or I've seen on social media, uh, we are in an equilibrium and uh, we need a balanced approach to our professional activity, which means that we cannot be black or white um, in terms of COVID and uh, COVID restrictions. Um, certainly, we are at a very confrontational situation, but here it's important to follow the principles of the rule of law. Okay, so I'll ask the question to Professor Kuch and ask uh, how these are solved. Side about the laws, but, but just giving a comment. I think, yes, we all agreed already that in principle, journalists, for journalistic purposes, it will be exempt from like traditional requirements of data, data GDPR. But still, I would say in Latvia, I think Article 5 would apply. Also, if you use uh, data for journalistic purposes, and for instance, if you really republish a picture from, let's say, Facebook or any other social portal, you really have to really balance in this case. What is the purpose? Was it the least intrusive measure? What is the only measure to achieve the aim? For instance, I also know Andres Vask mentioned about state officials, but for example, it might be also other person. For example, I remember my students told me the situation. For example, person is applying to municipality for asking to social benefits because he is low income family. But on Facebook, they see this person is having holidays in Turkey. Let's say and it doesn't go together. So you basically asking for social benefits. You don't have enough income. And at the same time, you are, it's a question. Okay, it's, it's not that these persons cannot go on holidays, but it's a question whether indeed your like financial situation is as such that it, it is necessary to provide for social for social benefits. But can can so, you refer? I'm sorry. Can you refer on that information which is acquired from social media, and can you also use it as a, as the official argument? I mean, I mean, this would be a question to ask. I mean, you can, if it's the only way how you can really question whether a person is indeed in a situation that he needs a social benefit. It would be, I think, a quite legitimate question to ask the person. I think you can you can refer to that in this situation. But as I said, the general principles that also our ombudsman already mentioned would still apply. Article 5, for example, that what is a legitimate aim? Why you republish this information? And can you achieve that aim without publishing this picture? All right. If you, yeah. Thank you. Anybody else? Great. So, um, ending this discussion, I need from you, each of you, uh, like a request or suggestion or uh, maybe the advice to all involved. 
how to deal with these questions. So, uh, you also already mentioned three principles. We are coming back again and again on case by case situations. Uh, we are, uh, we really need to prove that we needed this information and there were no other way how we can get this thing done or revealed. So, anything else? Um, for example, Evie would say to the journalist, because we are now trying to find uh, the common ground. Let's start with Evie. Anything you would like to ask, remind or suggest? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, the first thing, of course, uh, uh, journalists have to ask is, uh, is what uh, they are doing uh, really in uh, public interest? and uh, not only in their own or their followers' interest, if we are talking about influencers or bloggers. And uh, the second question, of course, is uh, really all those data needed for, the, for achieving the purpose. Those are the two main questions to be asked. And um, uh, then I would like to draw attention to the um, national regulation uh, and particularly to one article which states that um, uh, those exemptions may be applied only uh, when uh, compliance with the provisions of the GDPR is incompatible with or prevents the exercise of the rights to freedom of expression, which means, uh, for example, in the context of those uh, social med media, if you see that you can inform this uh, uh, social media user about uh, uh, the republishing his information, then why don't you? And if you can apply some articles of the GDPR, then do and don't rely on the freedom of expression just uh, because, of, because of the principle. And uh, one more thing is uh, I would advise uh, not to make everything a matter of law because sometimes it's a more matter of ethics and not a matter of law. And if we are using this um, general sense and uh, we feel each other, and uh, then yes, I think we can, uh, we can if, if we follow this uh, common sense, we follow the law because those uh, principles stipulated in uh, GDPR Article 5 is nothing more than, than this, uh, this uh, basic principles for respecting each other. Thank you. Thank you, Evie. Thank you. Um, Kuznakama is next. Natalie, anything else to add on uh, how we could end this discussion so we could find a common ground? the discussion will uh, only develop, uh, to be honest, but perhaps there are three uh, points that I would like to bring. First of all, um, one is related to the fact that this discussion, as many others, have, is often framed as freedom of expression versus right to data privacy or right to personal data. And I don't think it's honestly often the case. It's not that these two rights just stand on the opposite sides of the court and compete with each other. There have been, even in the court cases, findings that, for instance, the bulk surveillance uh, in certain countries undermines both data protection and right to privacy and freedom of expression. So it's often useful to think um, about these rights as complementing each other, not necessarily always competing with each other. Um, the second point is I would like to acknowledge what Andres has said. Um, about the environment that the journalists are making, uh, making decisions in, the fact that this is a fast-paced environment, that what is today the news tomorrow is not longer going to be the news. And if for the lawyers, it might be exciting and interesting to engage in the case-by-case -case balancing, then for the journalists, it's actually their bread and butter, and this is something that they need to often make the decisions on the spot. And to think how we can perhaps uh, help and aid uh, the journalistic communities, the ones who want actually to do the right thing, what would be those tools 
um, or measures uh, in order to support in that decision making. And I think one of them is already embedded in the GDPR, and this is so-called codes of conduct, right? So GDPR does allow uh, communities, be it um, business associations or communities of other interests, to adopt community-wide code of conduct that would regulate how self-regulate, how would data protection principles translate into the specific cases and apply to the, um, to the cases that are most relevant uh, to that specific community or society. And of course, it, it has to go hand in hand with the uh, um, monitoring mechanisms and bodies and all other system of safeguards included in the GDPR. But I think it's a good time to start a conversation how either the existing codes of conduct of journalists could be supplemented by some discussions on the data protection and privacy, or perhaps how some of the self-standing code of conduct could look like. As simply as that would help to um, perhaps bring GDPR principles as well a bit closer uh, to some of the cases journalists are dealing with, which are very different from the ones that small and medium business enterprises are working on or even large corporations are concerned with. So I think that could be um, uh, an interesting um, road to follow, the one that GDPR also allows us to take. That would be my take on this. So then uh, let's go straight to Andres and let's ask, do you have a, um, one of the journalist associations, do you have a code of conduct concerning the personal data uh, of people you're working with? Uh, microphones, microphones. So we discussed that uh, the GDPR is an opportunity to develop uh, internal codes of conduct. So do you have a code of conduct in your organization? Uh, I think that there are two uh, organizations that you work with in related to personal data. So, do you have uh, so, yes, uh, uh, our codes of conduct uh, include not spreading information that is ne absolutely necessary to achieve the goal of the publication just uh, in order to show that, we, yes, we have this information. This is usually something that we tend to avoid. But uh, uh, when it comes to a specific code of conduct uh, for personal data, there is no such thing. Of course, we have uh, the norms we observe uh, when we very strictly um, analyze uh, data that we have on children and minors uh, or health conditions. Um, but I think this is uh, something that has been traditionally a part of journalism. That is, this is not a novelty. Do I understand correctly that you have information that you have not published because it is not in the interest of public and the person in question is not a state official, but once the person becomes a state official, this information will become public. Well, we are not holding on to a database. We simply have some knowledge acquired over a period of time and we know where to look for it. Uh, this is our professional approach to things, but uh, we have some information that has not been published simply due to the fact that it has not been valuable to the public. We have three minutes left, uh, and now a question to the professor and the ombudsman. Word. <laughs> I'll be short, I think a lot yep. has been said already. Uh, just. Two things which, which I think are uh, already raised by Andres and also not our Yuris and also that if we, as regards state institutions, when we they decide and courts about access to information, I think what Andres really stressed that most journalists really work for society. It's not their own interests. That's how it should be. 
not always the case, but I would say in most the uh, majority of cases, it's the interest, it's interest of the society, not of specific journalists, to provide the access of information and take into account when balancing different interests. The second, as regards journalists, that's my conclusion from the cases, few cases I, I, I looked at. And also Andres mentioned that some courts, for example, allow access to judgment. I think the fact that the law says that information is of limited access doesn't mean that you don't have access to that. You just need to uh, provide a reason, argumentation, why you need access to that information. You can always ask and claim. But I think this is very often a mistake that uh, understanding that information which is of limited access has no access. This is not, not the same, I would say. Mm -hmm. This is also important to take into account for journalists. Okay, I'll stop here. And then um, we are coming back to what Natalia mentioned. We are not talking journalists or not. We're talking about journalistic purpose of the uh, using that data. So, and then we go on discussing from there. Um, so now, let's take a look. Yuris already mentioned his top three principles. Uh, but now let's take a look. The... Uh, uh, summary art piece of this discussion uh, by artist uh, Gatis Schluka is, uh, is it was watching and listening, and that's how it looks from his point of view. I hope no excessive data is published there, uh, but this one you will get in your mail as a reminder what you have done here. I'm sorry that's in Latvian, Natalie, but um, I know some Lithuanians who can uh, read Latvian too, and some words will be probably the ones you know. <laughs> so, enjoy this one. And thank you very much. Thank you very much for participating. Uh, we had uh, our ombudsman, uh, Juris Jansons, journalist Andrei Svasks, Natali Bityukova, board member of the Human Rights Monitoring Institute of Latvia, Evie Kreishmane at the State Data Inspectorate, and Artur Skuch from the Constitutional Court of Latvia. Now we will have a break and we will continue to discuss marketing and data protection and how they are friends and not enemies. We will also be discussing clients on whose behalf data is collected. We'll have a break until 13.30 Latvia time. Paldies. Welcome back. Let us talk about data protection in this conference on personal data, future perspectives. If that's what you came for, for, you're in the right place. My name is Valdis Melders. I will help you on what to press and not to press in the screen. So you can give us some personal data by uh, updating your profile on the website. You can also add questions there. We might not go through all of them, but we will try. Maybe try not to be very specific about certain issues. We are talking about general issues, red lines, the level playing field, and the opportunities for us all to cooperate. So the State Data Inspectorate will help us on uh, uh, in this quest and in this uh, second part, we will talk about data protection and marketing, how to be friends and not enemies. Marketing uses our data very much because this is how they understand uh, what to offer us and for what prices. They take a look at our 
data or where we live at where we work and then they can determine the specific prices and the uh, services to offer so how far can marketing specialists go so that both sides uh, win in the situation both the business and the customer we will talk to uh, both uh, public and private sector experts we will hear about the latest tendencies in the personal data processing field regarding marketing we will take a broader look at this area and at the end we will have a discussion with all the speakers of this part experts will share their experience and practical input so be ready to take notes and uh, if not today you will be able to watch this conference for a month on this same platform so about this platform at the top you have different halls displayed we're in the gamma hall if you return to gamma hall then press play to see the live broadcast next to the screen you have the comment section where you can write your comments and questions and you also have the survey icon there let's see how the survey works there's this letter i next to the comment section on the right hand if you press on the i letter a survey is opened and this survey is uh, on a very personal matter i'd say but as it is anonymous you can uh, take part in it because nobody will be named so be completely honest hand on heart are you currently wearing a, a tracksuit are you wearing sweatpants so no or 100 percent yes are you casual on top and uh, wet pants on the bottom or you change your clothes a minute ago so vote and only those who vote will be able to see the results let's see whether the interactive uh, whether the interactive function of this website works so next to the comment section the i letter here you will have this survey about whether you are currently wearing a tracksuit or sweatpants yes no uh, a part of it or no i just changed my clothes let's see so for me it is probably not or maybe i'm wearing sweatpants on the bottom so no, none of you have just changed your clothes none of you is wearing sweatpants so no 83 percent say that they're not wearing a sweat uh, a tracksuit but 17% say that uh, they're wearing sweatpants S but we cannot be completely sure about uh, our viewers right but in this uh, section in the comments section you can ask questions and provide comments to the speakers so in this part we will hear very specific recommendations we will hear about how privacy by design approach ensures the customer protection in marketing if you're working uh, in a company you will hear about internal activities on what should be taken into account when you're preparing a new product and privacy notices so we here we will hear uh, mr grabowski representing uh, gemius privacy and compliance council so i give floor to mr grabowski yes grabowski uh mr grabowski welcome um I need your microphone. Yes. Welcome. Thank you very much for the invitation. So, uh, first question. Uh, very general question before you begin. Uh, do you think that everyone understands how things are going uh, with uh, data protection or there's so many things yet to be done? Mm -hmm. Everyone, you mean consumers or? Uh, I mean the business people, because consumers, they don't have much say, I would say. But business people, how about them? Um, my opinion is that we have to do, to do many things yet. Uh, there are many things to do yet. All right. So, but, yeah. That's why we're here. You're welcome. Yeah, for this reason. But we didn't agree this response before, you know. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, Go. So, should I uh, start? Yes, because I didn't understand you before, <laughs> obviously. So, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Welcome. Thank you very much for introduction. And uh, let me 
let me initiate my short presentation. I think, I hope it will be, it will be useful for you. Um, you know, I would like to share with you my experience, uh, my, our experience in Gemis. Uh, when we are thinking about privacy by design, which means, um, which means uh, new approach, which is introduced in GDPR, um, where we are thinking about this, this um, approach, um, in many, in, on many websites in the internet, in the internet, in many um, guidelines, we can find many, many um, lists of issues which should be done in order to introduce privacy by design in our organization. For example, we have here on seven steps. What does it mean? Positive sum, not zero sum, proactive, not reactive. What does it mean? Who knows? On, on the left, on the right, you can see uh, if you want to use privacy by design, you should have um, to evaluate privacy in default settings, proactive to prevent breach rather than just react to it and so on, so on, so on. I would like to share with you um, my experience that, in our opinion, the, um, if an organization wants to, wants to follow this, um, this rule, privacy by design, this requirement of GDPR, um, that means um, it should be, the, this organization should made high quality data privacy impact assessment, DPIA, or um, PIA, privacy impact assessment. The, the both names are are used in the in the in the world, and um, I would like to share with you uh, this experience. Which aspects, which um, uh, aspects are important for us, and I think are important can be important for organizations. What is privacy by design? Data protection is an approach that ensures us to uh, to ensure privacy and data protection in all phases of our projects. Mm, this is for a legal requirement, which is, which is um, saying if you are introducing new uh, product, new service, please do private, uh, please do please, uh, ensure that privacy is incorporated in this project. And how to do it? I'd like to to say how we are how we are um, doing it uh, during this presentation. Um, as I as I said, we uh, understand that if we made high quality DPIA, which means data protection impact assessment, um, did this will means did, that means that we will. Um, uh, we will ensure consumer rights, data subject rights, we will ensure security, we will ensure data access and um, red data retention and many, many other issues which are, which have to be taken into consideration when we are thinking about compliance with GDPR. And um, so for this reason, we in Gamius, we are thinking um, about uh, DPIA as necessary documentation, necessary process inside our uh, our organization, and which is applicable not only to the um, to the places to the processes which are required by GDPR. Let me explain. GDPR says that um, DPIA. Uh, should be done you, on, on the right of the screen. You can see is your um, the, 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 you can see this graph. Is your processing likely to result in high risk? Yes or not? No, it's not DPIA needed. Okay, it's not needed. But in our organization, we think that it is really good to have it done for all processes, including marketing processes, of course. Uh, obviously, it's not a requirement, uh, strict requirement of GDPR, but 
uh, in our internal um, guidelines, we need to have DPIA for all processes which are um, which contains data um, data privacy, but uh, the personal data processing. And of course, um, you can see that um, on your market, on Polish market, on different markets, um, local data protection authorities has given his guidelines, decisions, when DPIA has to be done. And uh, of course, we can, um, we in our organizations, we can think that, uh, we can uh, think that, uh, okay, according to these local decisions, should we have this DPIA or sh we shouldn't have it? It is legally, it is of course, reasonable decision. But as I told, if we want to have a little bit higher level of compliance with GDPR or a higher legal security, it is really good to have this process. And let me explain in the second, uh, in the in the second um, next uh, slides, what do I mean when I uh, I am saying about high quality DPIA? Because of course you can find in different um, places in different books, books, websites, and so on, what should be taken into consideration during the DPIA process. I would like to underline today what uh, about our experience, and, and I would like to, to share with you uh, our thoughts. Obviously, in the, um, the first step in the DPIA process is the identification of the need of the, for DPIA. And this first step consists in decision if our processing is um, has to be uh, um, subject to this process. As I told, in games we are thinking we almost don't have this step. What does it mean? If I see, if we see um, personal data processing in our in our um, organization. First of all, we would like to have DPI, DPIA documentation, DPIA process, in our internal process. So, if in your organization there is formal, formal process for IT projects, for development projects, for marketing, new marketing initiatives, it should be obviously DPIA should be added to these formal, formal processes. Mm, I think here we should uh, underline also that uh, it is important to have privacy awareness of, the, of our staff in our organization. And during our engagements, during our uh, trainings, we are many, many, repeat, we are repeating, repeatedly saying to people that if you have new idea, if you have new um, idea about your um, way of processing data, collection data, and so on, please come to uh, DPO, to data protection officer, to legal department, and let's talk about it. And uh, we have internal blogs, we have audits. During our audits, we are um, uh, sharing you know, we are increasing this awareness of our staff during our meetings uh, everywhere in our in our company. Um, for in my experience, this is really fruitful way to share to 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 um, uh, to um, that this, the culture, internal culture, privacy culture in our in our um, company is really, really higher when we are trying to, to, um, to, in, to put this concept in many, many places, trainings, blogs, audits, and meetings. For example, many people during our, in, during the day pay day view business, in uh, other, other um, 
the participants are coming to us and they're asking, will it be, we are this idea, we would like to collect new data during, together with cookie, we would like to uh, order this cookie to process this data um, connected with cookie in such a way, in such a way. Should, um, what we should do to, to, to ensure GDPR compliance? So this uh, tasks in our internal in our internal um, in interfaces, our internal projects, um, these tasks uh, tasks are conduced by legal department, of course. Uh, the second step of DPI process is the description of the processing. And of course, uh, it is important to have in one place um, description. How is nature processing, scope of the processing, context, who is involved processing um, in, the, in the processing, who is processor from the, the, the sources of data, and uh, how data is processed, how is uh, data retain, retention period, how is defined, and so on, so on, so on. How we, what is purpose of the of the processing? So this part is obviously boring. This part is boring, and this part in our organization is uh, conduced by legal department, and the um, other department. Are only consultant have only consultants role in this in this step. So we are preparing, you know, uh, descriptions, and they they internally are uh, uh, are introducing their comments and their amendments and so on. Then we have consulta consultation process. I think this one is really really important. We have internal. Stakeholders, of course, as I told, different different departments, different um, methodological department, um, technical department, and uh, of course marketing and so on, processors. And but we engage sometimes also our clients. Obviously, not all clients. I think here it is uh, worth to underline that um, good relationship with. A couple of clients uh, can be fruitful in our business in this um, uh, in this meaning that we can ask our clients to let's talk about tests of our of our let's do the test of our um, ideas let's do the test of our new projects and we have such clients which we which them we can test our new uh, approach and uh, the, the you know the, the the data from this test helps us to make um, for, to make decisions about about next steps of of development of our products of course we can consult privacy experts um, in our gamus um, experience there is not uh, we don't use privacy experts externally, um, but of course it, it is possible. With data subjects, sometimes yes, we use, we ask them, we we uh, we do um, these uh, researches when a couple of persons are coming to us. We are describing, and they are saying about their uh, their obstacles, about their uh, their faults. Uh, this this consultation process is really important, in my opinion. Uh, from then we should, uh, during this um, high quality DPA process, uh, there should be obviously uh, described proportionality and necessity of the of the data processing. But as well, um, we should describe step by step. By step the way in how we would like to exercise the rights of data subjects, the rights of consumer rights, the right to opt out, right to be informed, how we we and our um, part, business partners are going to, um, to ensure these uh, rights, which are uh, obviously required by GDPR. 
And the second part of DPA process is uh, risks assessment. And uh, we use in our internal, for our internal purposes, we use uh, ISO, ICO uh, norm, uh, this one 2914, which is helpful for us because of it is it is quite simple methodology but uh, but it is really great. this norm is uh, dedicated for privacy issues i i mean and there we there are um, four types of um, different uh, different risks which are in this uh, in this norm we are listed legitimate access to data, unwanted modification, and the da data disappearance. In case, um, and the, the first one is really the one which is most often um, used, identified in, in the world of cookie, um, of cookie and marketing um, issues. I mean, I think about abuses in the meaning that Sometimes the risk of processing data for unclear or undefined purposes by us or by our um, by our business partners, those risks should be taken into account really seriously. Another uh, risks, which I mean, unwanted modification and data data disappearance, is not so. Um, According to our um, our uh, assessments, are not really really um, likely to be to be materialist. The, those risks risks are, you know, unwanted modification. Um, when we have one many one billion, most of more than one billion. Um, um, hits in during it, uh, one hour it is really uh, really difficult to to modificate some of this data in our internal databases i would like to share with you some you know some uh, example of uh, risk map of one hour project um, this map is prepared according to as i told to this ISO, ICO norm um, methodology, you can see risk seri seriousness and risk likelihood, which is negligible, limited, important, or maximum, and you, you have to, and um, during this DPA, uh, it should be, um, level of these risks should be defined by us. Mr. Grabowski, yes. we have uh, one minute left, so can we finish on Yes, okay. This is last or one of the last, yeah. Uh, this is last uh, slide. I think uh, when we identified and assessed risks, we should uh, implement measures to reduce these privacy risks, um, tem uh, agreements and technical uh, measures. And this DPA has to be reviewed uh, and this process of review have to be done by legal department, but together, once more, together with consultants, clients, and so on. This is um, this is an um, uh, example of uh, measures which to reduce privacy risks. And I would re recommend to you SNIL uh, open source tool to into to, to make this the EPIA, high quality EPIA, we use it in our in company and it is really useful. It is my recommendation for us and this useful, this or this tool can be download from website. I wanted to, to share, the, to say only that um, in our company, we currently, um, we are making currently many, many uh, DPIA processes for the reason that the internet, the future of internet, when which we can image is uh, the internet without third party cookies. For us, it is really challenging and we are making many, many DPIAs for this reason. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Mr. Grabowski. By the way, uh, we will need you also on the discussion and maybe uh, getting ready to that discussion. We have uh, some questions from the uh, platform. Uh, can you please share how many FTE are involved in your privacy and data, pro that data protection team? And are you performing data protection due diligence of contractors? Those are two questions. Uh, uh, and can you repeat the like last question? To, Sorry. Uh, would like to hear at the discussion. So the first one, can you please share how many FTE are involved in your privacy data protection team? And are you performing data protection due diligence of contractors? Those two questions from the platform, but you can find them also uh, under uh, or next to our um, uh, transmission window uh, at the commentary box. So maybe you can also answer straight there if you use our platform. If not, let's meet at the discussion later on. Thank you very much. Thank you. So the discussion will take part in English and you can access the simultaneous interpreting by pressing on the headphones icon in the left corner. Then you can pick uh, the correct language, so if you do not understand any of the languages spoken. Next, uh, we will hear the presentation of Elena Viltan about privacy disclaimer and cookie policy to ensure company compliance with GDPR. Elena Viltan is lawyer at the telecommunications company Pite, and if we're talking about all these privacy disclaimers and uh, cookies, Everyone is just accepting everything on every website. And here I would like to hear your input, whether everyone's just sick of everything and accepting everything, or maybe that's not the case. Please, the floor is yours. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Val. This you already introduced me, but I'll introduce myself uh, again. My name is Alina Viltsana. I'm a lawyer at BITA, a telecommunications company, and in this presentation I will share my personal opinion uh, on how uh, cookie policies enable compliance with GDPR of telecommunication companies. I think most of our listeners today know what GDPR means. It is a general data protection regulation, which is a data and privacy policy by the European Union. Um, and I will uh, touch upon the very foundations of this regulation as well. So privacy disclaimer or privacy policy is a document or a compilation of information through which personal data manager provides information on personal data processed uh, of uh, natural entities. It includes all of the information required under sections 13 and 14 of the GDPR, uh, including information on the data controller, personal data recipients, data categories, uh, purposes of um, of uh, processing this data, the types and tools used, etc. Uh, I think that uh, the most problematic aspect is uh, defining the purpose of uh, of uh, this uh, data processing and uh, to justify it. So I will uh, continue to talk about these two aspects in my presentation. Why is it important to correctly define the purpose of processing? It is important because data processing will only be lawful if it is needed to achieve specific purposes, meaning that uh, in the privacy policy developed by data controller, uh, you need to assess the objective of uh, data processing and it must be indicated. If there is no such purpose indicated in the policy, the controller cannot process data based on this objective. There is an exception applied to rel uh, related objectives uh, where data is collected for one purpose but later used uh, for the purpose of statistics. This can be a related objective and it can also be used for this other aim. 
Uh, besides defining the specific objective, data controllers must also ensure that all of the data collected is really necessary to achieve this specific objective. And I'll mention an example. We um, discussed marketing and imagine if uh, the controller has uh, placed a form on their website where viewers can um, in put information on their themselves uh, in order to contact these people later and offer them uh, services uh, via telecommunication companies and they can indicate their name, surname, phone number and email. So the question is whether all of this information is really needed. Uh, we wonder why uh, emails are necessary because they will not be used. Uh, also, the same thing goes for the person's surname, because you do not really need their surname to provide uh, a specific uh, service or product to them. So make sure that uh, upon defining these objectives, uh, you really, really take into account which data is vitally needed. The next thing I would like to discuss is to correctly defining the legal basis of data processing. There are six uh, legal categories and none of them are more important or better than the other. To choose the legal basis correctly, you need to assess what is the purpose of data processing and what is the relation between the controller and the data subject. For instance, Local governments do not have legitimate Ill interest or state-owned enterprises as well. Uh, these uh, entities act on behalf of the public, so they cannot uh, ground data processing on legitimate interests. But uh, when it comes to employment, uh, both parties, the employer and employee, are not on an equal standing, and so... Uh, we must ask ourselves whether uh, data subjects consent is adequate. This um, also relates to video surveillance uh, at the workplace uh, where an employer asks for a consent from the employee, but in reality the employee does not have the option to re reject. So in this case, uh, the legal basis would be legitimate interests for the purposes of protecting property against theft or illegal activity. So this is something all data controllers should think about. If you choose performance of a contract as a legal basis, you should assess whether this personal data is really needed to enter into agreement and perform it. It shouldn't be just uh, defined in fact if it's not really needed. Uh, if you choose um, protection of legitimate interests as a legal basis, this must be included in the privacy policy and if it is not included, then data processing cannot be performed. Also, data controllers should perform the balancing test. If you choose consent, uh, as I mentioned, it should be taken into account that consent should be free and willing and the data subject must express his or her uh, readiness to consent and it should be proven. In my slide, I have mentioned one example, one real life example. I think many of you have seen the text. Uh, I agree to that my personal data is processed. And if you click accept, uh, everything is fine. And if you click I do not accept, then you cannot buy goods or services and cannot continue using the site. So the question is whether this is a, a free and willing consent. Um, and has the person that has accepted the processing really is really familiar with uh, the principles and they know what they are uh, consenting to. If uh, a person is declining for his personal data to be 
processed, he cannot actually use the product. Another question, why do all companies need a privacy policy? I think all company need that because any company that has at least a single employee is carrying out data processing. Uh, also, uh, I would suggest that you should ex assess uh, whether you need one single privacy policy in your company or several policies that uh, regulate different categories of data subjects. Uh, for instance, there should be a candidate's privacy policy that describes how candidate's data is processed. Another policy for employees which describes how employee data is processed. And another, if you have clients or partners, you should have a third policy for processing their data, respectively. If you develop uh, a common policy, policy, privacy policy, uh, it will not be transparent, and the data subject will be will have to read a lot of information, uh, which may not be relevant for specific data subjects if you have several categories. And now we go on to the next topic on how to develop privacy policies. When developing privacy policies, you should take into account the principle of good faith and transparency, which means that you should provide information on the existence and purposes of data processing. This information should be provided in a brief and simple language. Due to this, uh, I also recommend uh, data controllers to evaluate uh, if perhaps a company privacy policy should be developed that includes basic information and then have uh, separate detailed information on data processing. For instance, if in the policy all the uh, legal basis applied by the controller are used, followed by all of the objectives, and then followed by all of the data subject categories. This policy will not be interrelated uh, and would not state uh, which objectives are related to which uh, legal basis, etc. But if you had separate policies, uh, each uh, of these aspects would be indicated for a separate data subject category, and each of those categories would see on what legal basis and for what purposes their data is processed. I would highly recommend this approach, especially if you're operating with 10 objectives and 10 different categories and aspects in your company, uh, because this information makes it really difficult to read privacy policies. Now, continuing with cookies and what kind of nuances should be indicated in the cookie policy. What are cookies? Why are they used? Uh, for what purpose are they used? Uh, are they used to maintain the website or are they third-party cookies? How long will they be used and saved? And it should also include information on managing and retracting cookies. I uh, also believe that uh, most of you have seen the following disclaimer. And the website uses cookies. By continuing to use this website, I consent to using cookies. But the question is uh, whether the data subject has in fact consented, and I think not. Uh, in this example, by default, continuing the use of the website provides a cons content consent by the user uh, which is exactly what uh, Valdi stated, that all of us just simply accept it and do not look further into it. Uh, if uh, any of you listening uh, see this kind of phrase on a website, uh, please do not simply consent. Um, and please note that this is not explicit consent. 
another phrase commonly used is that by continuing to using the website you agree to all uh, cookies. Uh, even if you do not know what kind of cookies are used and what is their purpose. Um, uh, in fact, if you click on learn more, uh, uh, you should be able to, to select which cookies you want to use, but if you don't look into it, you simply agree to them all and uh, in fact you have not perhaps consented to all of them. Sometimes also uh, on websites, you can accept or deny all of the cookies, uh, which is uh, not right. So my practical recommendation uh, would be to please reassess the use of these cookie banners and uh, add some sort of opportunity for website visitors to select to which cookie categories you can send to and uh, indicate specifically uh, which category is used uh, uh, to indicate the categories and the objectives that they are used to achieve and also indicate information on how long the cookies will be saved on your computer. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Ms. Viltana, I hope that uh, your speech will be saved online and people will be able to uh, make some notes. I think <laughs> some, of, uh, some of the people listening to us have now jumped on line to see uh, the banners themselves. I'd like to invite you to join our discussion later on because we have some general questions to discuss. Yes, I will. Thank you. Moving on, we have two more uh, presentations and then we'll move on to the panel discussion. You can also submit your uh, questions on our platform. Uh, you can find the comment section next to the question section and uh, you will be able to ask these questions to our presenters later on. Data protection in the field of electronic communications then and now. And this uh, looks to be a huge future trend. Our next uh, presenter is a certified data protection con solutions consultant and GDPR solutions advisors for business clients at Squalio. Elizabeth, uh, I will say that I have no idea what this means, uh, but uh, please explain. This, um, uh, CERT stands for Certified Data Protection Specialists. Uh, Taking into account the fact that my presentation is in English, I would like to present myself once more. Okay. Uh, my name is Elizabeth and I am a data protection consultant in Squalio and uh, today we will take a look at data protection then and now, as well as what the future holds. But without further ado, uh, let's begin. Uh, we digitalize consciously and unconsciously. And here comes a question. What do we know about ourselves and what do others know about us? The emerging challenges as we grow into new types of society uh, require new skills, a new approach to follow the trends. So let's dive back a little bit in the, in the past and see uh, what data protection was in 2014. So, in November 2014, The Guardian addressed online privacy concerns by asking how much do we care about our online privacy. At that time, internet privacy had become one of the most widely discussed topics in the media. Online app holders constantly are breaching their own privacy rules. And people don't value their, da their data as much as they say. Because e-commerce customers don't trust companies to keep their data secure. Yet, they still keep using these sites. And most privacy policies could be simply summarized. There is no privacy on the internet. But nobody is concerned about that once again. People want to feel in control, even when they're not. A control paradox. 
Uh, studies show that by letting uh, consumers decide precisely what information to share, they effectively, effectively end up sharing more and potentially becoming more vulnerable. And we are victims of our own disclosure, really. So an example for that is <clears throat> Facebook. So while Facebook users have uh, tended to increase their privacy settings over time, in the period between 2005 and 2011, they also increase the amount and level of personal information they share. So people find it easier to trust businesses than actual other people. And we're not naturally inclined to trust others. So reputation and word of mouth is a strong currency in the sharing economy. We trust in how honest and competent other users think the suppliers are. Ultimately, the key question is not so much whether the consumers will accept an even higher degree of datification and invasion of privacy, but what they will get in return. It is a trade-off between what we give and what we get. But let's move on to a little bit uh, closer past. Uh, year 2018. At that time, uh, massive updates of privacy policies um, of the online companies were going on. Machine learning cuts down time for our searches and actions. For example, Alexa is always listening. But it appears we don't know who sees our data. Even the people whose business it is to know, they don't know. Then it came out that consulting firm Cambridge Analytica had harvested the personal information of more than 50 million Facebook users and offered it to clients. And they did not even hack anyone. Did we look into it before? Of course not. We indicate to others that we want privacy, but do we have right to privacy? People are inconsistent about the kinds of exposure they will tolerate. They do not ask from the same level of privacy from everyone. It is just some particular apps, businesses, and so on. And now let's look at year 2020. We all know a uh, COVID pandemic has brought us new challenges, changed our lifestyle and some old habits may never come back. But before COVID, what did we expect the trends would be? Like for example, uh, data ethics will be more important. Consumers are caring less about their data being captured and more about how it is used, especially uh, if it is sensitive data. Customers are looking for transparency about how data will be used today and tomorrow. But as of now, it is not often that such transparency is given. And I think you should all, uh, you could all agree with that, that we don't really know what's going on behind that uh, screen. And privacy protection will need to be uh, continuous and unified because several departments of the company are working on data privacy and processing processes. But as they lack the team lead, privacy fails. We have to learn to cooperate because all employees need to be aware of uh, corporate data privacy protection. And if you don't have it, then, <clears throat> then this will require, require a cultural change. No compromise is possible. And further, um, personal uh, circumstances will continue to drive professional change. As an example, during the pandemic, when businesses had to deal with uh, uh, contact tracing, uh, they ended up being not compliant with data privacy obligations at each step. So what do you think is the next challenge here? Who is, the, um, who is and isn't vaccinated? Information you can't have unless it is voluntarily provided. So businesses will still keep on adjusting to the changing circumstances. Another aspect of uh, today's world is the employee monitoring that will become a bigger trend. Our day-to-day -day operations from remote locations are on massive focus. Because if you look at a working style now, many businesses have gone uh, to a work from home model. Personal lives blur with professional. Businesses will still have to work out how to be mindful of how they protect their data and track its use or vulnerability and avoid uh, of monitoring employees' home lives. So you will need to find that, uh, that balance between their personal life and their office life, right? Even if they're at home. And lastly, data privacy law enforcement will return to a more punitive attitude, which means that when laws like GDPR came into effect, the fear of violating the law was uh, enough to make responsible businesses to make uh, 
responsible actions and comply at every turn as much as they were capable. But today, there is mo even more legislation in play. Today, it seems that in the upcoming years, we are more likely to see a return to stricter measures. The European Data Protection Board has instructed European supervisory authorities to shorten their patients. Even in 2021, we saw more fines and much larger ones than previously. So it will be critical for businesses to do a cultural shift. Uh, keep an eye on data privacy, uh, compliance at all times. And I don't mean to keep your documentation in check. What I mean is that you will definitely have to change the whole culture around data privacy in your organization. And let's move on. So do you remember the times when we uh, grew up that the day we obtained passport was the greatest affirmation of our identity? Today, our identity is no longer about what we get from the state. By transposing our lives uh, into online and remote environment, we started to develop our e-identity. Actions we take online are habits, locations, connections, you name it. All those have created our true identity. The one unfolded to public, the one we use several times a day to manage our day-to-day -day necessities. Yes, there are some downsides, but we definitely enjoy the benefits of it, noticed or not. And now um, let's, look, <clears throat> let's look at the milestones of our lifestyle. What happens if we get disconnected? First, uh, think of the impact uh, on us as individuals and on businesses in general. So when um, Thomas Edison inven invented a light bulb, he wanted to bring the light. Today, electricity is massively consuming natural resources and we are worried about. And also when Sir Tom Berners-Lee invented the World Wide Web, he definitely had good intentions and could not imagine that this resource should someday be abused. So all inventions human beings have introduced at the first moment definitely have been helpful to us. But down the road, uh, though, we start to take it for granted. If we unplug economy, we fall back into year 2000, the moment when massive shifts into online happened. Um, so yeah, the first one would be identity and privacy. We sometimes say, uh, if you're not online, you do not exist. So if you get disconnected, then all that you're left with is your passport, your friends within the reach of your hand, uh, memories you have intentionally collected, books on your shelf, and a view outside your window. Not bad, but we are no longer used to such limitations. Privacy, um, yes, you will have it, and probably nobody would collect your data much, because the only way uh, how to sell something to you would be reach you on the phone. So, or if you're at home, then knock on your door or send you a letter. But today, uh, data are spread all over the internet, like a box of photos we would have casted in our trash box. Secondly, <coughs> is the information and assets. You may have one book or entire internet of information. And we still do remember the exchange of letters between business partners um, that took a month at least to make first uh, process of establishing cooperation. We may say that disconnecting uh, revives our senses and we will find a way if we need, but the possibilities offline are far less than online. You get what you could find not the, and not the best solutions really are offered. And the more we use internet, the more we know scope of information available is enormous. This is where we have been saved by machine learning. It sorts out information available and provides us with personalized offers. If a group of people would uh, search Google by typing a basket, each of them would get its own results. But the downside to that, we cast in the internet all information we have, when we have it, and just because we have it. And this actually leads us to the loss of privacy far more than anything else. The third aspect uh, what, of what would happen if we disconnect is distance and mobility. <clears throat> so some of us can still recall that it was possible to reach us on phone just when we were at home. To get to a client meeting and back could take us half of our day. And by the way, that time was billed to the clients. Commuting to work and back was too time consuming, so we chose a workplace close to home. Cross-border work went along with moving to another country, probably. 
But today, we have a life without borders. Remote work, the choices have significantly expanded. While traveling was forbidden, uh, we learned how to shop online, uh, see places online, enjoy art. Everyone can have an e-commerce platform, really. Uh, just try like Shopify or big e-commerce e e platforms and that you have it all. And lastly, the time and effectivity. So how many steps it took us to order pizza back in time? Find a restaurant in the phone book, call and ask if they have pizza. Ashamed but need to know what is the price of the pizza and if we can get it on Tuesday. After the pandemic, even the laziest companies will keep their online solutions. So while boosting effectivity, we lose the time for ourselves. We lose our ID. So the response time to an email is 30 seconds to five minutes. So if we are all are effective, it is a roller coaster you cannot stop. And really, the data um, really just helps us to have time for ourselves and our family. And further, uh, what does the future hold? So digital sustainability, this is where we head to. We have to share the information that matters, stick to our privacy and still get database decisions which is why we must protect our data so much more than we did, for example, six years ago. We must keep in mind that many businesses operate because of personal data, and there is no such thing as free application. We must be more cautious than ever when, we, when giving our data to companies. That includes online purchases, uh, social media platforms, and other businesses. We can't trust companies to protect our data and be mindful uh, users of our data. However, the biggest task for you is to keep your own data safe, because if you don't, then nobody else will. And uh, thank you. Uh, that is um, the end of uh, my presentation. No, actually, thank you. <laughs> presentation. Mēs um, gribēsim noteikti. We will certainly want to hear you in the discussion part, for sure, yes. And if you can access the platform, you can check the comments section. There are some questions to you. Maybe you can prepare questions uh, and answers if those are specifically meant for you. And now we will continue. Thank you to uh, Elisabeta Kolomenska. Reminder to those who are listening to us in Latvian. Currently, we will switch to English from time to time and the interpreting services are still available in the uh, lower section with a headphones icon. If you press on it, then you can choose Latvian or English according to your needs. Before we switch to the discussion, we will hear about measures to be taken to ensure compliance with the GDPR. Those will be practical advice from the French Data Protection Supervisor. About what's coming up, uh, including the discussion. Uh, now, please welcome uh, Sophie Nermon, Sinil, uh, representative, uh, Economics Leads Udraudibus Director, and the organization is more or less in my national French Commission Nationale de l'Informatique et de Liberté. Uh, more or less. That. Very good. <laughs> Thank you very much. Très bien. <laughs> yeah, uh, you're on, uh, Sophie, and uh, we would like to know exactly what we should do and what we shouldn't. <laughs> That's a very broad program, but I'm very happy to share uh, these uh, talks and discussion with you today. And I want to thank the Data St State Inspectorate Republic of Latvia, our colleague, because that was very uh, kind to uh, offer to the CNIL the opportunity to speak about the practical advice uh, given from uh, the supervisor point of view to the professionals and to the citizens. So next slide. I would like to give you first um, an overview. If we go to the next slide, yes, very good. Uh, to give you an overview of our strategy as a regulator, what do we intend uh, to do and how, 
uh, you will see that we are considering we are a well-balanced institution working on two legs. We have the leg to support professional bodies in their digital transition, and we have the leg to make a success of the challenge of the European governance for the enforcement part. And uh, you were told already about the importance of the repressive aspect in the GDPR. And so I want to very briefly to show that um, we are supporting um, the public and private sector uh, by providing legal certainty helping innovation and foresight, uh, using and uh, helping the data protection officers uh, because they are already uh, chief of orchestra as a compliance orchestrator, uh, working on certification, practical guides, tutorials, video, MOOC. We have one MOOC uh, that will be translated in English. And, uh, of course, the other part uh, of the job uh, is the complaint management, the controls, either on site or remote, and sanction. And these lead, uh, next slide please, to the general assessment that we provide on the aspect of the supportive action. And it could be uh, helpful for you to know that we published a strategy for the support of actors, uh, general support or sectorial or personalized um, last March, uh, that we um, are building some tools like hard law or soft law regulation. And uh, the difference between the two, because I know that's a question very often asked, is that uh, if you don't respect as a data um, provider, a, da a data um, um, controller or even a, a processor, these uh, hard law, you will get a sanction. But for soft law, if you don't respect it, you have to justify, document, explain why, why you are not respecting those recommendations uh, established by the CNIL. And uh, uh, of course, it's more complicated and uh, very often the actors want to have clear uh, information. And um, so what we have done, and I shall now make a focus on uh, the direct marketing and especially uh, cookies, because that was uh, really uh, the, the, at the core of uh, the discussion. Uh, and uh, we had uh, the two aspects that I was mentioning, giving guidance and very concrete recommendations and also have a control program and sanction. So I shall elaborate on this now. And please, you can go to the next uh, slide. And now it has been uh, ready uh, an action plan on advertising ta targeting for the overall compliance of public and private players targeting French internet users. And so we will see together what are the new rules for cookies with uh, some amended guidelines on cookies and other tracking devices with a lot of concrete advices given to first the professionals and also the individuals. So we always want to have this double aspect. And after, we will have a look at the repressive policy currently being pursued by the CNIL. So that will give you the whole picture of what we are doing and what are the concrete uh, recommendations on what has to be done uh, when you speak about uh, cookies. So let's go first with the next slide to the new guidelines on cookies and over tracking devices uh, with concrete advices given to the professional. 
it has been now a few years because you see that uh, uh, the, the action plan um, started in July 2019 on targeted advertising and uh, we have adopted guidelines and cookies uh, following a consultation with professionals and civil society. That was to, in order uh, to clarify the ap applicable rules and best practice in this area, uh, because of the entry into force of the GDPR and the increase of rights given by this regulation, and clarify the condition under which the GDPR reinforces the rights of the internet users to enable them to maintain control over their personal data against cookies and traffic to tracking devices that are very frequently used in particular when browsing websites. We had to elaborate amended guidelines the, the following year uh, after a consultation again on a draft on practical uh, procedures for collecting user consent for the use of online trackers. And uh, let's have in mind those two fundamental rules. The internet user must be informed in a clear and synthetic manner of what the tracers are used for. He must be able to refuse cookies as easily as accept them. And of course, this is the rule, but how to apply this rule in our world where you have so many information given and uh, it's a difficult world to live in because the technology is going very, very fast. And so we have to run, run behind and sometimes to anticipate uh, the changes. So during this year, we have published many, many information for professionals on our website with some translation in English, not all of them, but uh, I shall tell you uh, the one. Uh, and so an explanation in a clear uh, way on cookies and trackers, what does the law say? Um, questions and answers, more than 30 on the guidelines and the CNIL cookie and other tracers recommendation, uh, because of course you try to um, be as clear as possible in the guideline, but uh, there are always questions. So you have the set of uh, uh, FAQs, but they are not translated in English, but uh, now that's quite easy to do that. Uh, cookies, uh, how do I bring my website into compliance? So what are the, the, the steps to do it? Uh, uh, some solutions given for audience measurement tools, uh, the challenges for the protection of personal data when you speak about targeted online advertising, uh, alternatives to third-party cookies. Uh, so you see we add more and more documentation on the basis of our connections with the actors asking for a specific development on a specific matter. So, of course, uh, what I'm giving you there is connected to uh, our website where you can find uh, all the details on these uh, guidelines. And now, next slide, we go to the, um, the aspect and concrete advices given to the individuals. Uh, and for them, we have a small explanatory about uh, what is the history of the cookie. Uh, we have uh, given some documentation on cookie walls and personal data monetization because that leads to some legal and ethical issues. We give advice for mastering uh, your browser and uh, we, uh, we give illustration, uh, some tools and tips um, to monitor uh, your own data. 
uh, and uh, we are explaining to the attention of the internet users what changes with the evolution of the rules for the use of cookies. And uh, we, uh, for example, um, and I, I think it's quite uh, interesting to go on the CNIL website because uh, we have, we are managing cookies too. So uh, we are giving these uh, uh, sentences and explanation to the users. So that could be a good example of what has to be done taking uh, this good practice uh, from the CNIL to manage your preferences about cookies, applying those um, mention of information. And uh, I just wanted to mention CookieViz, uh, which is a software developed by the CNIL uh, to display the cookies stored by third party domains when browsing the web. Uh, this tool was very successful because the, co the source code is freely accessible uh, and it makes possible to detect the cookies deposited on the first page viewed by an internet user. And we received uh, a prize that, and we were very proud of that uh, this year at the 43rd World Privacy Assembly uh, hosted by the Mexican Data Protection Authority. So uh, now that we have seen all the aspects uh, supportive action from the CNIL, let's see uh, the uh, aspects of the repressive policy that will be next slide. The repressive policy currently being pursued by the CNIL because, of course, it's not enough to say what you have to do and what you can't do. We have to check and uh, to sanction um, in a case on um, lack of compliance. And we had given a deadline for, uh, given uh, from adopting the, the guidelines. And this guideline was expiring uh, last, last March. So we are now ensuring that all public and private players targeting uh, French uh, intern, internodes uh, are complying with these rules. First, from last year already, we adopted around 70 corrective measures. Those corrective measures are either orders or sanctions in connection with non-compliance with the legislation of cookies. To give you an example, there is uh, um, one of the main uh, daily newspaper called Figaro. Uh, got a fine of 50,000 euros for installing advertising cookies uh, without obtaining the prior consent of internet users. What we can see is that in 60% of the cases, uh, there are organizations with a parent company outside France. So the measures mainly concerned large private sector players from a very wide variety of economic sectors. And now uh, for the, from the results of the second campaign of orders and future action, uh, at the moment we are issuing orders to around 50 players that still do not make refusing cookies as easy as accepting them. Uh, at the moment, 80% of the players uh, concerned have brought themselves into compliance. And uh, so this is a, a work in, um, in progress. And uh, to finish with the um, law enforcement process at the CNIL, next slide. Uh, I think it's quite interesting to give you uh, the global picture of how, how the things are going on when uh, the French regulator uh, goes in a repressive um, aspect, but I shall not elaborate, uh, but you have this uh, small um, uh, report on infringement reports, investigations, the outcome of investigations leading 
uh, either to the closure or to um, some penalty, uh, being public or not public, monetary or non-monetary. And to go on to the actions to be taken uh, last next year, uh, to know what we will do uh, in 2022, we will go to an amplification of action to support the professionals. And uh, I close, uh, I very close dialogue with professionals uh, with a focus on sovereignty because that's uh, uh, something that uh, is more and more on the table with cloud or uh, artificial intelligence uh, on board. And there will be a more assertive law enforcement activity on three aspects, and one of them is a strict compliance with cookie rules. And there will be two other uh, big uh, thematics, health data processing versus security, and cybersecurity relating specifically to websites. So you see that the aspect of uh, cybersecurity are more and more um, important. And uh, last but not least, uh, the personal data diplomacy at the European and international level. And your uh, in conference uh, today is uh, one of the uh, aspects of uh, this uh, uh, last uh, thematic of our uh, strategy. So thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I think we will have the debate to uh, have exchange questions and answers. Thank you, Sophie. Thank you very much. Um, merci. Um, we have uh, all four speakers ready, gathered. A uh, short introduction for our listeners in Latvian. Mēs šajā diskusijā runāsim par... And we'll be discussing uh, the relation between marketing, privacy policy, developers, uh, disclaimers, cookie policies, um, and our panel uh, members today are uh, Jata Grabowski, representative of Gemius, Elin Viltsana from Bita, uh, Elizabeth Kolmanska from Squalio, and Sophie Nerbon, representative of the CNIL. Uh, some of uh, the audience questions have already been answered on the platform. Meeting friends uh, and not enemies. Hopefully, we will end on that note. We will be um, mentioning, of course, cookies and uh, privacy statements. And um, at the end, by the way, we will have also a artistic view on our discussion drawn on the big paper. Let's see how artists are viewing this discussion. But now, let's start with cookies. We finished with cookies and let's start with cookies. Um, in Latvian, cookies, it's very simple word, is sigdatnes. So in case anybody asks you, do you know what uh, cookies are in Latvian? It's sigdatnes, easy word to learn, could be first in Latvian at all. Um, for those um, so, to uh, those uh, who want to hear interpreting into Latvian or English, just press the uh, specific button with the headphones icon. Uh, for me, as one of the consumers, users, convenience is the word. If something is convenient, I will go that way. And accept all is the most convenient way. You don't go into there, you don't look into there, you don't read all the statements, all the things, agree everything, accept all cookies, done. So, uh, my question will be, do we really need those, all those things and statements and, and the cookies for all the businesses they are using them? Uh, and uh, about those new guidelines on cookies, uh, Sophie, you mentioned, so the rejection should be as easy as accepting them. Does it change anything? Or consumers still go for accept all and don't look into them at all? So how that works? Uh, your experience, please. Maybe we can start, whoever is ready, please raise your hand. 
or just push the button, the hand. So where are we? Is it working at all? Is it really uh, helping uh, consumers to, uh, to manage their data, which is available for services and businesses? Yeah, Sophie? And then Jacek. I think uh, I have not been clear enough on my presentation uh, to insist on the fact that uh, uh, what, uh, of course, you as a consumer, you find something simple to do. And so it's why we insisted so strongly, because it's very easy to accept all the cookies, very complicated to refuse them. And what we said in our last uh, uh, guidelines is that to respect the regulation, and the regulation is very clear on the fact that uh, uh, you have to uh, have a complete transparency and uh, cookies are very, uh, are all you want except transparency. Uh, and it's why I, I said uh, that you can read our notice on our own cookies, and it's possible to to, to change uh, something. And above all, uh, you have more and more internodes not not wanting anymore to uh, to be um, followed by so many marketers, and they want to maintain the control over their personal data. Uh, and it's because we are living, as it was said very clearly, in an increasingly connected world. Uh, so that means that uh, if you don't respect this regulation, and we have more and more complaints about it, so that shows that everybody, everybody is not sharing your views on the uh, reflex of the consumer to say, oh, I don't bother about, uh, uh, about cookies, I don't care. And so, for some persons, uh, they don't care, but they have the right not to be uh, followed and they have this right to consent to have the information in a very clear uh, way. So that's what I can say on that. But um, Sophie, do you think uh, consumers really, in general, understand what cookies do and why they should be accepted or denied? What people understand is that if they ask uh, for information on a specific topic, they will receive more and more information about this topic. And so they know that they are followed and uh, uh, all the information we receive uh, is that uh, this time is over and that uh, uh, this intrusion in their private life is no more something they can accept uh, and it's why we have elaborated uh, those new guidance uh, and of course there will be the e-privacy regulation uh, to give more uh, details on certain aspects and so it's why we are waiting for the e-privacy regulation to complete the GDPR regulation. Yeah, I will ask also the businesses what would be the benefits for the users or clients, but now Jacek, your take. Microphone, microphone. Okay, yes. Uh, thank you very much. I think um, I agree with, with uh, Kniel, of course, from one side, from other side, um, let's talk. <laughs> and uh, so uh, I agree that, uh, you know, businesses are, um, uh, or have introduced these requirements about informing in a really legal manner, strong, hard, legal in the meaning that there was the information which was published on, which are published on websites usually. I'm not talking about CNIL website, of course, as we saw during your presentation, but I'm talking about, you know, usually on uh, on different markets where Genius is operating, we see that uh, we can notice, we can we see that the information delivered to, to data subjects are really, really long, are really, um, of course, because, you know, during, in GDPR we have Article 14, which where we, um, it is said that the information should contain this, 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 and, re and this is really 
boring string, string. This is really boring. So lack of trust, transparency um, during the introduction of, of GDPR in, in, in requirements uh, has resulted that, uh, for example, DPAs in many data protection authorities in many countries has um, started to saying that this um, this practice is unacceptable, and I agree with it that um, that the, the consent the user must be able to accept as um, or refuse cookies as easy as accept, accept them, of course. And uh, this is the first step. The second one is transparency. I think. Um, in Danish in Danish market, there was such initiative. I I don't think so. It is not unfortunately. It is not a wider initiative. In Danish market, there was initiative to to express different types of cookies in the icon on the bottom of the website. And if this icon was um, enabled or uh, disabled, it, it was. It means that you accept or you don't accept this type of cookies. I mean, necessary necessary was not presented, but um, uh, statistical cookies, advertising cookies, and functional cookies. There was four, three. There were three types of icons on the bottom of the website, and every user um, could. In a very easily manner by clicking of the of this icon, um, uh, could um, uh, manage the, the the settings of the cookie. So it was really an um, initiative, really really important from my side. But unfortunately, it was not uh, wider. It has not wider, um, you know, uh, markets. Um, so. Uh, from the other side, I would like to underline from the business uh, perspective, we would like to have information, high quality information. We would like to ha have high quality uh, pictures of website services and so on, but informatic people, IT admins is cost, servers is cost. Yeah. Um, the uh, climatization, air condition is caused, blah, 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 blah. so everything is costly. If if anybody, the, if the user, final user, is not paying, obviously we know, we all, we, we know about it. Um, final user is not paying for the, the service with cash, he's paying with this cookie. Is cookie intrusive? It depends. I would say it depends, and this is the point where we probably we, we could discuss a little bit more with with Kniel. Is it really intrusive or not? It depends on the of, of the on the on the, uh, on the company who how it the processing is made. Uh, we what kind of information is gathered and so on and so on. So, but uh, this is my point to start, you know, our our discussion. And I would like to to to, to introduce my position in this way. Thank you. Uh, yes, it's a very interesting take. Uh, are you saying that uh, companies can uh, deny service or, or or any further information just because people are denying um, the usage of cookies because cookies uh, are the um, the currency. So if I yes. in, in in some manner we could say in this way, you know, because from in, in marketing perspective, you know, we have a budget for marketing and we give it for we would like to know that this budget is efficiently used. So for this reason, cookies used, we, we would like to know that this man or woman is interested in sport. So for this reason, we are giving some, some kind of advertisement to his or her. And this, you know, this cookie is, this information is important for two weeks or three weeks, no more, because after two or three weeks, this person is not interested in this in this point any, any, anymore. Obviously, um, so in this slide, this easy, I, I, would, I would call this type of advertisement in, uh, light advertisement. Of course, when we are talking about 
price that that prices are adjusted to previous your previous uh, behavior on on website mm, it is really strong and it, it is really intrusive and they, i will agree with with of course okay. with data protection so, point let's talk to other yeah yeah so uh, so it is one take uh, the answering question what is benefit for the users or clients that's the way you are paying for uh using the services interestingly enough uh, so anything to add elena elsbeth Maybe I can add, uh, uh, yeah. I would say that uh, at cookies, we can look from three perspectives. First is, uh, for example, for business perspective. Business would uh, say we need as much marketing cookies as possible because from marketing cookies, we can see who visits our uh, web pages, who, which categories of our web page are uh, we used as most and so on. Uh, from legal perspective would be the second one. From legal perspective, it means that uh, lawyers states that uh, we need to provide in cookies policy that and that and that, who are cookies, for what purpose these cookies will be used and so on. So it means that from legal perspective, lawyers want to be safe, that everything in this documentation is uh, done correctly, compliant with GDPR and so on. Business, business usually doesn't care this uh, uh, legal uh, like opinion they are just uh, thinking about their business benefits and that um, and about talking uh, with cookies i would say that is correct because the idea if you are talking about marketing cookies it's uh, definitely based on business interests and uh, this third phase is uh, consumer interests uh, if I'm talking for my experience as a consumer when I go in some online shop web page I never read this cookie banner because I already know what is written there. Maybe that's because I'm a lawyer and I know basically what kind of information is there. But I believe that uh, basically the most of uh, web page visitors doesn't read this information. They, they think that uh, cookies it's equal to like marketing cookies. Cookies means that I will get some uh, marketing ads when I go into my Facebook account, into my Instagram. They doesn't read and, and they are not uh, informed that uh, cookies might be also used for analyze purposes of this web page owner. So basically, I would say that uh, from consumer perspective, consumer think that cookies, it's marketing ads. And uh, if I am going into this web page and I have this possibility to accept or decline the cookies, I would say if I accepted, it's okay because I was informed who are cookies, for what purposes these cookies will be used. And uh, I gave my like wish that I want to accept these cookies. Uh, if I change my mind, anytime I can go into my internet like the settings and I can uh, like delete all the saved cookies. Oh, where is it by the way? <laughs> Don't ask me to provide this information in this presentation. Yeah, because it's very detailed, but you can go into these cookies policies and there is explained that you can need. So uh, Sophie is, uh, said that uh, basically you need to have this opportunity to uh, decline the cookies as easily as you accepted them. And basically in real life, it, at this moment, it is not possible. You can uh, go into a web page and click accept uh, cookies by one click, but you can't like uh, decline these uh, cookies by clicking this one button. Mm -hmm. At this point, you need to go into your internet browser uh, setting information and then found, found out where to like decline these cookies and uh, that's it yeah that's that's what i mean because legally everything is yeah. correct except who knows where that is uh then of course i will come back to sophie asking is it maybe just fair that people should accept cookies and that's kind of currency if you want to use the service but before that um elizabeth uh yeah about this uh so uh what said that um, lawyers want one thing but the organization as a whole wants the other thing uh, i think that um, there must be some somewhat a synergy between what lawyers want and what your organization wants as a whole because i think that 
if there are correct policies and ways for people to like decline the cookies after all, for example, then the work for the organization with the data is much more easier and safer. So there's, it's not just about the one person, it's something that I mentioned in my presentation as well, that everybody, like every single one of the company's employees must be uh, included in data protection. That's why also you see that all those uh, GDPR trainings, they're made for everyone, every single employee, instead of just one DPO, because the, the workers, they make the company. And if they don't know how to safely uh, work with the data, then no policy, no documentation will save. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, uh, Sophie, what about being fair uh, towards the businesses as a consumer? Yeah, let's, let's have a deal. I accept all cookies and you give me your services because marketing needs them. Well, um, that is a very interesting question. It means uh, how, uh, how far can I go to monetize my data? And uh, can I sell my data? Uh, because you know that uh, uh, no, nothing is free. Uh, and if you think that you can go freely on a website, it's because your data are uh, the, the money. So that's uh, an exchange. And uh, on this aspect, um, uh, there is two answers. Uh, the first one is uh, uh, on a general point of view, uh, the fact to sell the money, uh, to sell your personal data. On a legal point of view, you can't because uh, uh, that's a fundamental right uh, and that uh, we have some high jurisdiction, either European, either in France, the highest court of uh, administrative court of justice said that uh, uh, you can't sell your data, you can monetize uh, them, that's right. But uh, uh, speaking about cookie wall, for example, uh, you know that this cookie wall uh, consists of blocking the access to a website uh, or a mobile application for the user if this user is not giving his consent. So what we said uh, at the beginning in 2020 and then 19, sorry, is that it was not possible to have such a cookie wall. And uh, the highest court of justice in France told us that there, it was not possible uh, to uh, prohibit this practice in principle, because that was a case by case approach. Uh, and so uh, we have to determine if the consent of the individual is free uh, and if uh, a cookie wall will be legal or not. And so what we consider is that at the moment we have already uh, some websites uh, uh, giving uh, the possibility to refuse uh, as easily as you accept all the cookies. Of course, I'm speaking only about the marketing cookies. I'm not speaking about the security cookies or uh, the technical ones being necessary for the technical uh, navigation. Sophie? So, it, we almost, or for a moment, we lost Sophie. <laughs> Okay, um, one thing to talk about or think about. If there is no transparency, if sorry, you don't give your sorry. consent, we, we lost, yes? We lost you for, for a minute. We lost you for a minute. Ah. <laughs> Just come back. Okay. Yeah, a little bit. Okay, uh, what, um, was you, uh, uh, when I was saying that uh, the cookie wall uh, may be um, the fact that there is there are some alternatives to cookie walls uh, yep. because for example you can have a micro payment for a specific uh, article uh, and you don't have to uh, accept to give uh, uh, all your data mm -hmm. uh, you can use the altruism you know the um, uh, what is in uh, the governance act with common goods. So that's also another possibility. So definitely we are considering 
uh, that uh, um, the, the of course we know that the the economic aspect is very important, but that there are new ways for marketers. Uh, to try to uh, show the benefits of what they want to sell. So, uh, the cookie wall could look like uh, this. There, there's a cookie wall which says either ready to pay, uh, either ready for ad advertisement, accept uh, all cookies, accept some cookies, and then some content is available, or nothing, and then you're out. So, you have a choice, and you mm -hmm. go anyway. Yep, that's the point. All right. The point is that uh, if you have uh, the possibility to um, go on the website, not exactly on the same way if you had accepted cookies, that should be fine. Okay, good. Because uh, there could be some solution if there, are, there is still a fair information given and uh, a clear and free consent given. Good. So, what privacy risks can be identified in the use of cookies? So, now let's talk about the uh, security part of the cookies. And uh, who would like to uh, comment on that? Because what methods are used to identify these risks and strengthen the protection of the personal data of the internet user? Because one thing is you accept them and then what happens next? And what are the privacy risks? Um, yep. I could... Sorry. <laughs> Yep. Uh, yeah, so um, about the privacy risks, um, I think that um, since the data in the cookies don't really change, the problem is who gets the access to those cookies. So, for example, the abuse of the user's internet browsing history and the misuse of the cookie data, uh, like, for example, a session fixation, and uh, as well as, uh, you know, the cookies that are in their use, they could uh, place them somewhere else and use uh, as a digital pattern and create an identity of the user. Mm -hmm. Because uh, nowadays, uh, people are using different kinds of browsers. They have found something called incognito mode or some other mode, the way how to say it. And they uh, think that that's the way how they refuse all the cookies everywhere. Uh, can you also please comment on that? What about that security? Uh you know that uh, incognito mode or private browsing mode it does like to some extent i believe to like uh not let the companies use the cookie data as much but um uh, for some reason people don't really use the incognito mode like every day because if i would open a web browser i would not directly go to the incognito mode that's for sure and i don't think uh, other people would do that as well the only time when i do that is uh, for example when i would like to book tickets and you know there are um, places that uh, adjust their prices on how many times you visit the page so now so, now we yeah. are talking that if we are talking about the consumer rights we could come to the point where incognito mode would become a must-have number one choice. Uh, could that be, in any case, solution? Because you've been mentioning the tickets and other products uh, where cookies are used to, uh, uh, to put the price on the service or the product. Because we have those uh, already for a long time ago for different kind of services, including um, uh, avio tickets and so on. But we, can, we will come to that. So on security issues, once more, any other comments, please? What privacy risks can be identified in the use of cookies? Sophie? Microphone? Yes, I would uh, say uh, on the risk that uh, uh, there is uh, the risk of processing sensitive data because uh, using cookie makes that you have all details on your consumption, what you're selling. Uh, it gives a very, uh, very uh, detailed profile of uh, who you are, what age, what residency, what. Uh, so the. Processing of sensitive data is particularly protected by the GDPR, again. Uh, and so there is the greatest vigilance to have on that. Uh, and uh, um, um, security matters. Uh, what is interesting to know is that in the e-privacy regulation, 
uh, the, the CNIL is welcoming uh, cookie uh, implemented to ensure a better security. So that could be quite useful on this uh, aspect, you see. Uh, you have to keep in mind that there are different kinds uh, of cookies. And so on um, uh, the security aspect, that could be uh, used. Mm -hmm. And then uh, also the question uh, about the cookies and organizations. Linda is asking on a platform uh, in the comments, who in organizations should own the cookies policy? So what's your take in your company or what is the... Uh, suggestion or advice on this who in organization should own the cookie policy or take care of it but the the cookie policy relies uh, on each data controller and the problem with um, uh, cookies is that you have the third party cookies uh, and so you you have to pay attention to uh, uh, who is um, going to track this information and use it again. Uh, and as our tool called DataViz uh, shows very uh, very um, clearly, uh, there is really uh, like um, uh, that's like a web cob uh, with all the persons. Uh, where um, the, the information uh, goes. So each data controller is in charge of the policy, the cookie policy, and it has to be uh, self-explanatory. And that's not a, an easy thing to do. Uh, it's why I was focusing on the information we are giving on our website, because that could be used as good practice for the professionals. Um, then we have already next question, yeah, Elin. Um, yeah, I uh, maybe just a short ad uh, about this topic. Um, yeah, I would say that the cookies policy itself is like a legal document. So it definitely means that lawyers, DPO need to review uh, or, or maybe even write this cookies policy, but uh, DPO or lawyer won't be able to write this cookie policy without uh, assistance of other uh, departments. For example, e-commerce, maybe even some uh, cybersecurity security team because uh, cookies are very like not tricky but they are sensitive topic and uh, they uh, these uh, colleagues which are known about these technical aspects they need to like explain these lawyers or dpo what information what cookies uh, uh, this uh, like uh, company will use and so on if uh, it means that uh, basically lawyer can go into some uh, Google, just Google cookies policy example and uh, just put this cookies policy example in this company's uh, web page, then this doesn't work. Mm -hmm. That was better. So yeah, just to quickly add uh, here uh, for, for the cookies and everything, you can also um, use the marketing specialists in your organization because uh, they work with them on daily basis. They're the ones that get the statistics out of them, the views and everything. So they are the ones that actually know a lot of uh, stuff about about cookies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Jacek? Only one uh, additional, maybe it is important from a security point of view, not um, privacy policy. We are talking about pseudonymized data. I would like to highlight this, this one aspect. Uh, cookies not cannot be directly um, and we cannot directly um, extract individual from cookie. We can say that this number is interested in this, 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 this. So for this reason, I would like only, only to highlight that we are treating, talking about pseudonym, pseudonymized data and security risks are obviously as uh, as told uh, was told previously, who has access to data, sensitive data, and so on. Obviously, but uh, at the same time, the cookie is only pseudonym. Thanks for so this. Are you saying that you're using only the quantity? You are not going into individual information from the cookies. Obviously, uh, we we don't have such. Uh, 
probably we could have such a uh, possibility, technical possibility, even more. We we have this technical possibility when we, when some cookie comes to me and asks me, uh, give me my info. What do you know about me? Okay, I have to introduce uh, exactly technical uh, solutions to to ensure that this person is really this person and not whoever. And um, after that, I can extract from the big, big, big um, uh, database the information about browsing of this cookie on different sites, but only sites where um, the, 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 the cookie of this cookie provider is present and not another site. So browser history is not, a, it's not accessible from the cookie provider point of view. Uh, browser history is for, for, for browser um, provider and not cookie provider. Okay, I will go now with two controversial announcements or questions. And one is, do you agree with the statement that third-party cookies, Sophie mentioned, uh, should be prohibited in view of third parties' efforts to track the behavior of a website user by linking them to their activities across other apps uh, like on social networks. So, do you agree that the third-party cookies should be prohibited if we talk about the third-party efforts to track behavior of the user across the apps and social networks? Prohibited. Anybody on this? Elena, uh, Elena uh, your camera somehow is not stable. Is your internet okay? Yeah, okay. Fine, good. Yeah, anybody to comment on this? Third-party cookies prohibited to track uh, my activities because, of course, I'm asked. Uh, will I allow? But, uh, but let's let's be honest. I, I not always understand what do you mean by me being tracked across somewhere. May I? Yeah. Uh, I would say that it depends on the purpose because. Um, we, we are talking today, obviously, most of all about uh, advertising cookies, and um, maybe it is important to, to, to distinguish between advertising, functional cookies. We are not talking about security, of course, as told previously, Sophie, uh, but what about audience measurement? I mean, clearly statistical cookie. If uh, two websites want to, to, to express uh, to others uh, how many users do we have or not do we have, it should be, um, it should be uh, clearly, transparently um, assessed by external third party in order to have, um, you know, uh, data, transparent data on this. So when we are talking about statistical data, I don't, see, I, Personally, I don't obviously, but obviously for the reason of, of my company, of course. But for in when it comes to statistical purposes, I don't see so big uh, privacy risk. Obviously, when it comes to advertising risks, uh, advertising cookies, it's a different story. Okay. Other views? third-party cookies across, uh, or we agree that statistically it's important and that's fine and why not? So, because uh, for me, cookies are like uh, a map which shows where I've been, but doesn't show where I'm going. Because I just bought a car and then uh, the whole year I will know how much cheaper I could get that car now because I've been tracked all across the services and all services are trying to sell me the same car, but cheaper. So the question is, um, is there any use on this? And that's why the next question is, is effective marketing possible without the processing of personal data? So yeah, maybe statistically as quantum, not person by person, it is important for statistics, but that's my next controversial question. Is effective marketing possible without the processing of personal data? Perhaps it's necessary to think of like new innovative ways? Are there any new ideas in the market how to do that? Elisabeth? 
Um, I think it is, but you would have to put in like 20 times more effort in uh, researching your client base and guess what they would be interested in. And you would definitely not be able to target people individually because you just simply wouldn't have the crucial information for it. Uh, in other words, uh, consumer personal data. Uh, about the alternatives, I think it is... Um, Relying on cookies is just a one way for marketing professionals because as the privacy evolves and becomes much stricter, um, you must find uh, cookie and third party cookie alternatives that are suitable for your business. And I think that the best strategy for that would be to have multiple strategies that collect information about your audience and target them effectively. Uh, using those various strategies alongside um, each other can produce <clears throat> even more beneficial results uh, than third party cookies alone. Mm -hmm. Any other hands, ideas? Good. So now let's move on to that um, discrimination question. Because Elizabeth already mentioned uh, that she is using a incognito or private browsing, uh, buying tickets, knowing that because of cookies, which have been tracking the amount, the prices, the purchases, uh, companies know exactly how rich you are and what you can afford and how badly you need that thing. So, uh, what about discrimination uh, in this? So. Does the use of cookies contribute to discrimination and differential uh, treatment? Or, it's a free market, why not? Okay. <laughs> okay, so let's start. Um, in my point of view, it's, it's a question about transparency, first of all. So, uh, if... Um, I, in my imagination, perfect world, there should be uh, there there should be one sign be near the, the price which means this price is adjusted to you you know <laughs> from this point of view uh, when the cookie is used to adjust the prices it should be clearly uh, um clearly um this information should be uh, should be ad um, applicable to the situation it should be given to the to the internet user from in the Let's call it in the in the perfect world. Um, so that this transparency is important. And if some, uh, unfortunately, it is possible. Cookie uh, makes possible. Cookie made possible. Make possible the, this this uh, discrimination treatment. Unfortunately. So are you saying that it would be fair, but in this case, always when the price is given, it will say clearly that we've adjusted the price because we've, we uh, tracked you through the cookies or something like that? Yes, it should be given to the, to the consumer and uh, maybe, maybe from other side there should be some description how to avoid it. Um, it is difficult to, to you know, <laughs> because business is killing uh, itself by this by this communication but uh, maybe not is killing but uh, you know um, uh, everyone wants to sell with higher price mm -hmm. okay how businesses are looking at that and uh, also from the legal point of view is that okay because uh, most of the people don't understand how these things are working. Elsbeth does. That's why she's using the way. From a legal point of view, maybe it should. Be, maybe it is okay because some someone has agreed to the use of cookie, but he or she doesn't know the consequences of this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So for this reason, the transparency is needed. Maybe some uh, some actions from the DPA from should be should be involved in in this in this manner mm -hmm. yeah so i, I would uh, only add only that uh, the mode this private mode is not blocking the use of these techniques mm -hmm. because they are being used on the web pages not on the browser web pages ips flash cookies and so on so this is not functioning yeah. but but also using this uh, mode normally there is a uh, disclaimer saying that it doesn't uh, really make you invisible 
Uh, all right, uh, Eileen. Yeah, I just wanted to add that at this moment we are talking about this like uh, bad uh, experience of these cookies. Why aren't we talking about this uh, good experience and Let's benefits go. of these kind of cookies? For example, like if we are talking about these Avio tickets, uh, if you three times have visited this Avio company's web page and wanted to buy this uh, trip to Italy, but you didn't because this price was too high for you maybe fourth time when you visit this web page this web page will like offer you better solution for example 10 euros less price that is a benefit for you because Elena, you accepted that kind of cookies elena will they i hope so that's how marketing works so how far should i go and where should i drop out to have <laughs> this <laughs> That's your individual experience. Basically, you anyways can decline all, uh, like to delete all cookies you have saved. It means that if you delete the cookies, basically it would mean that uh, these web pages doesn't uh, have this any information about you anymore. But uh, if you want to save these cookies, then maybe use another, not your computer, but use your phone. And uh, yeah, let's see what your phone will then provide you. <laughs> Here. <laughs> All right, um, Sophie, uh, one question for you uh, on the discrimination. Do you feel that there should be any uh, intervention, intervention from any organization into the way how businesses are putting price on each individual uh, reading their cookies? Uh, can you hear me? Because I, okay, that's fine. Because I, I had to disconnect and reconnect because I lost you. Uh, so speaking about discrimination, uh, we are working uh, with other regulators. I mean, uh, what is important is that uh, uh, as data protection supervisor, we are not in charge of uh, discrimination because there is a specific uh, defensor of rights in charge and we are working with him and we have done that on uh, insurance premium for example uh, but we, we didn't work on cookies so that that is uh, an aspect we could work with uh, uh, over regulators and it's what we call interregulation because there is uh, consumer right uh, uh, problem, uh, competition problem too. So we are working with the competition authority uh, and um, not uh, only with uh, the data protection uh, issues. And sorry to, to, to add because I was disconnected, but I, I wanted to go a bit further on the different techniques and alternative techniques to uh, third parties cookies because uh, as it was said it's very interesting to have in mind uh, all the um, new technologies and not only to uh, stay uh, based on cookies which are quite um, primitive uh, and not very often not adequate uh, relating to uh, the legal um, rights of individuals you have fingerprinting uh, you have the internal cookies of the side of the site uh, and um, uh, that's uh, what it's called technically uh, CNEM clocking uh, and these techniques allow players um, uh, who delegation uh, said they, they skip browser blockage. Uh, you have the single sign on, you have court targeting systems, uh, you can deport certain operations, like, for example, advertising auctions to, you, to the user's terminal, uh, and it's connected to have some system being in-in, and it's the user who decides to, 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 to give the access. So the technology is giving us a lot of new innovative a way of doing uh, the marketing business. Mm -hmm. And last point, uh, and I, have, I will finish, I will 
I will come back to um, what uh, Jacek was speaking about with the icons, because uh, it's true that uh, as we all know, nobody is going to read um, mentions of information being more than uh, three lines uh, long. And so uh, icons, I think uh, they are promoted in the GDPR. And I should be very interesting to go further with you, Janek, later on your uh, initiative taken, uh, because I, I think that should um, uh, that should be, uh, of course, a, a European uh, icon uh, or even more. Mm -hmm. And then um, we are closing in to towards the end of our discussion, and of course. Even for you, I would need uh, at the very end uh, one thing, uh, like an advice, a suggestion, a request from all the parties, what you could uh, do to make it more effective for both businesses and users and clients. Uh, and uh, so that game is fair. But before that, one last question. Should supervisory authorities further explain the risks of personal data protection and cybersecurity related to the use of cookies? And what should be educated? Service providers? Consumers? Who? Because, you know, these days, some revolutions are starting not because people are living badly, because they are left out. They don't understand what is going on. They don't understand all those windows on their screens, what they have to do. And they starting to grow angry just because they don't understand. So where lies the educational part of this? Yep. Sophie? I crawl. What is very true, that is very, very true. What you said is really true. And uh, I think uh, we can uh, add the CNIL and uh, it's uh, for all data protection supervisors in Europe, um, uh, this uh, uh, revolution, uh, it's really the fourth uh, industrial revolution in the world uh, and from uh, the beginning of uh, humanity. Uh, and of course that uh, everybody is uh, more or less lost and nobody can say that he, he completely understands everything because that's really going very, very fast. And it's why uh, we, we try to give more um, concrete examples in the daily uh, activity of uh, citizens. And uh, we have this double um, dialogue either with the professional, the actors, and trying to find solutions, but also uh, to make uh, things change. Because uh, what is true is that uh, the digital world uh, was built on some economic models uh, being, being uh, really problematic with uh, the new regulation on data protection. And if we want to have this uh, data protection being effective, uh, being uh, uh, appropriate and implemented by professional. Uh, professional tell us that uh, uh, they, they want to have clear rules to understand and that uh, those rules are applied by everybody. And not only uh, the one in Europe, for example, or in one country, of course. So that, that this is why um, it is so important to have a common approach at the European level, now that we have a worldwide standard with the GDPR, uh, and applying to uh, those models. Uh, I think that uh, uh, Google working with uh, is privacy uh, sandbox or uh, experimenting new uh, techniques uh, is very important to have in mind and uh, and to respect the the text because as it was said uh, the sanction will be uh, harder hev heavier and heavier so I guess that could also be your like last word in discussion too. <laughs> Thank you, Sophie. I think so. Yep. Um, welcome. Others?
So the closing words and uh, who should really be responsible for uh, like dealing with this knowledge and information? What should be educated also service providers or consumers? Uh, Jacek. Microphone. In my opinion, you know, um, I, would, I would like to, to express that uh, who is um, hmm, service pro providers should work together with DPAs, with data protection authorities, and data protection authorities, of course, together with service providers in order to um, to uh, to uh, mamma mia. <laughs> in order to, to, to educate consumers, of course. For, you, you know, I, I mean, there is some kind of um, necessity to cooperate with between the, those two service providers, providers and DPAs, because of the, um, I think there is some kind of uh, misunderstanding about, um, about um, professional, um, necessities, professional expectations towards DPA. I'm not talking about, obviously, the giant big, biggest uh, companies. I'm talking about these businesses, smaller bi businesses. Um, this misunderstanding is um, about the... Um, sometimes DPA is... I feel, I feel that sometimes DPA is giving uh, so wide guidelines or excluding some kind of um, processing uh, without, um, maybe without reasonable, um, without reasons. But this is my opinion, and it should be discussed in this, in this, um, uh, between those two uh, subjects. Mm -hmm. uh, as for um, privacy sandbox, I would, uh, I would ask, obviously. Um, DPAs to talk with uh, anti-competition um, anti-competition uh, authorities because it looks like from my point of view and for tech from technical point of view that it could be used by the biggest companies to uh, exclude other companies from the market. So for this reason it is really important to be to act really, really um, carefully, and uh, at the end, at the end, between from the cooperation between service providers and data protection authorities, should result um, the better um, security for consumers and better transparency in communication. Not and uh, and this is my hope. <laughs> Thank you, Jacek. Well, um, Elin, else better. Yeah, Ellie. yeah. Uh, I would say that uh, data inspectorate's opinion uh, or guidelines are very useful not only for service providers but also for consumers. And if we are talking about these privacy risks that may arise of uh, cookies, then I would say that uh, this topic isn't like uh, discussed much. Uh, and uh, if data inspectorate would uh, like give them opinion or guidelines, I would really say that uh, it would help not uh, only for consumers, maybe who don't understand what exactly cookies are and uh, for what purposes cookies are used, but also for these service providers. Mm, for example, as I provided in my presentation, there still are some companies and some web pages who still uses uh, on their web pages this cookies banner who isn't compliant with GDPR. We, don't, we are not discussing some more detailed information and some privacy or cyber security risks or so on, but we are talking about this basic information that this web page owner states that uh, if you uh, continue to like visit this web page, you agreed to use all kind of cookies that's not compliant with GDPR. So basically, that is uh, like uh, we, we need to start with that. Mm -hmm. And uh, these are service providers, web pages, owners, but also we can't forget about consumers. 
Yeah, that's the point. Actually, we are trying to find a mutual uh, respect and trust uh, on which to build that. Otherwise, uh, consumers will start to ask in all sorts of authorities to regulate things and businesses will lose at the end. Uh, so, uh, and Elisabeth, anything else to add? Uh, yes, uh, so as all the my colleagues have already mentioned, education is good and I fully support that, uh, but also to remember that um, Eileen just said that many uh, businesses go through with the formal approach to uh, documentation, uh, to the GDPR uh, uh, compliance, and uh, it's not the way to go because um, if we look then actually on the inside, it's total chaos. And we can see that just by looking at their web page. And if their web page is not in order, then we definitely know that inside it's total chaos as well. So yeah, that's what I wanted to mention. All right, thank you. Thank you, Jacek, Elin, Elsbeth, Sophie. And uh, now summary art piece by Agata Schlioka. You can uh, see yourselves and what you have done. It is in Latvian, but I can try to, uh, try to translate. So let's see what Gatis has seen, our artist, uh, how things went uh, at our discussion. And it says, Jacek is asking, really, cookies um, are intrusion into your private life? Really? 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 Then uh, Elena is saying that cookies can be also good. That's a good reminder. And then Elizabeth is saying um, there's no services for free. Something should be paid anyway. And yes, nothing is for free in this world. Sophie reinforces that view and also, of course, uh, finding the common ground. So that is how uh, our artists uh, saw our discussion. <laughs> and you will get it in the mail, so you can use it on your wall uh, as a proof. That's your certificate of taking part in this discussion. Thank you very much. Runājot par certifikātiem, jums arī būs iespēja savējos saņemt tēpastām, ja būsiet līdz galam noskatīt. You will receive this caricature in your email. And uh, this discussion, this conference will be available for a month on our webpage and also on the State Data Inspectorate's YouTube channel. And uh, solve problems where interests are common. Paldies! Strādājumi!